big, big showcase. I'm really enjoying doing these, even maybe more so than the little appreciators, because with here I have something to wrap my thoughts around and bring it out, and it just... It gives me a, something to chew on. I mean, I'm still, if you've got topics you would like to hear me uh, address, by all means, I mean, send them in. Oh, and I want to mention, I'll mention this on the next Appreciator Regular as well. I was contacted by Shambles Constant, who we featured recently on the big showcase. And uh, he is uh, dropping off. And not, nothing, everything's fine. There are no worries. He does this periodically for, you know, life gets busy. There are other things to do. And when he's here, he's very active. But uh, he is on one of his sabbaticals probably till the end of the summer. And hopefully he'll be back then, but he'll be back. Uh, the Shambles is just such a great guy. And all the interactions I've had with him, uh, I don't think I've ever spoken directly to him but we've exchanged emails for years and it, he's a really really sweet fellow very much and very real uh on his podcast pretty much the same guy and he in fact is on some of the vic and sade showcases um the vic and sade casts rather that jimbo did which uh, as this show goes along we will go through those as well but uh, this time, uh, we've got some other stuff. Uh, we, we're going to have a very interesting part one, and we're going to try something. Uh, I, over the next two episodes, am going to present a novella by um, science fiction writer Murray Leinster. Who I, he's one of those golden age science fiction writers who had a really nice touch and whipped out tons of uh, books over the years and stories, really committed to his fiction, and read by LibriVox science fiction legend Phil Chenever. So we're in for some real treats. Um, we're going to have the first three chapters in this very show and the second three chapters in the next um and we're going to have our usual on-sug and old-time radio, and who knows what else will turn up. Um, and speaking of old-time radio, without any further uh, driveling, so to speak, let's jump right in to a vintage episode of Vic and Sade, which, I don't know, this is becoming my favorite thing to put on any of these shows. Listening to these shows again, which I haven't for years, is a real, pure pleasure. And now, get ready to smile again with radio's home folks, Chris Goes, Vic and Sade. Brought to you by Procter & Gamble. Isn't it grand? Chris Goes running another big contest. Yes, I know. I've already sent in a couple of entries. I'm not missing any opportunity to win that $2,500 first prize. $2,500. Why, with that much money, I could fix up our whole house like new. Lady, just think of the things you could do if your entry won that big cash prize in Crisco's second and final double cash contest. Besides that top prize of $2,500, there's 25 prizes of $100 and 100 prizes of $10 each. Yes, 126 cash prizes. And remember this. You can double any prize you win. Yes, just submit your entries on the official contest blanks, available only to Crisco dealers. Or, now listen carefully, if your dealer doesn't happen to have those blanks, here's another way to double any prize you win. Write your entries on plain pieces of paper and have your dealer sign his name and address on each entry. Either way will double the amount of any prize you win. It'll double that big first prize of $2,500 to $5,000. Now, to enter, write the fifth line to a jingle that's on those official contest blanks. The first four lines go like this. For cakes, pies, and frying each day, most any wise housewife will say, for cakes, pies, and frying each day, most any wise housewife will say, use Crisco, it's sure, so creamy and pure. Use Crisco, it's sure, so creamy and pure. 
Da-da-da, da-da-da, da da day <laughs> Now, that's where you just put a last line, see? Maybe something like, and your meals get a hearty okay. And just remember, your last line must end in a word that rhymes with day. Now, doesn't that sound easy? Why, the ideas will come fast once you've tried cooking with that wonderful new Crisco and serve your family the delicious Crisco cakes and pies and fried food you get. So you won't have any trouble at all getting ideas for last lines to Crisco's jingle. Oh, and say, don't hold back on those entries. Send in all those last lines. The more, the merrier. Because each additional entry means another opportunity to win one of those swell cash prizes. Now, here's what you do. With each last line you write for Crisco's jingle, mail your name and address and a Crisco label, any size or facsimile. Address Vic and Sade, Cincinnati, Ohio. That's Vic and Sade, Cincinnati, Ohio. This contest is open to residents of the United States and Canada. Entries will be judged solely on originality, suitability, and aptness. Decision of the judges is final, and duplicate prizes will be awarded in case of ties. Remember, your Crisco dealer has official entry blanks with complete rules and the Crisco jingle printed on them. You'll double the amount of any prize you win if your entry's on that official blank, or if you write your entry on a plain piece of paper and get your Crisco dealer to sign his name and address on it. So see your Crisco dealer today, will you? Don't miss this grand opportunity to win and double your winnings in Crisco's Double Cash Contest. <laughs> Well, sir, the evening meal has been over only a little while as we enter the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook, equitably dividing sections of the newspaper. Vic has just made a casual observation, which his wife apparently finds upsetting. For we hear her say, Why didn't you tell me before? I saw no particular necessity for it. Matter of fact, I considered it such a trivial matter it slipped my mind. I knew we weren't going to the picture show tonight. I knew we weren't playing cards with Fred and Ruthie. Oh, a whole batch of company coming and you don't even mention it to your wife. Since when have Steve Chessbutter and A.J. Spence been company? Well, no, but just the same. How long you suppose they'll stay? Oh, an hour, an hour and a half. It's a lodge committee meeting, see. I don't imagine it'll require more than an hour and a half on the outside to wind up what we have to do. <laughs> I think you're getting forgetful in your old age. The same shoe fits your foot, don't it? You never said anything about Miss Brighton and Willard dropping in tonight. <laughs> I figured the same way you did. I knew we weren't going to the moving picture show and knew we weren't going to play any 500. Well, the situation doesn't seem to have any disastrous angles. When your large fellow's coming? 7.30, quarter day. That's when Miss Brighton and Willard said they'd probably stop by. Oh, uh oh. -huh. I suppose you'll take your company out in the kitchen, hmm? Well, we'll want privacy, of course. After all, we're working on lodge stuff. Just Butter and Spence aren't paying any social call. <laughs> they might feel like they're getting the dirty end of the stick getting shoved out in the kitchen. Oh, no. Just Butter and Spence are good fellas. Common as old shoes. They'd be just as happy if I took them down cellar. Oh. Uh -huh. Uh, the telephone's ringing. Telephone's ringing. Oh, it'd be comical if Fred didn't have to put in overtime at the foundry after all, wouldn't it? And they want to come play cards? Oh, I imagine mm. one of Russia's pals generally is. Hello? Oh, yes, Miss Donahue. No, all through and got my dishes washed and wiping in the pantry. Not at all. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Oh, that's too bad. Uh-huh. Why, sure. Sure. No. Oh, of course. Send him over. No, no. He can waltz right upstairs and lie down and rush his bed. Sure. All right, fine. Fine, Miss Donahue. All righty. Goodbye. Brother Donnie, who paid us a visit? Yes, her sister and kids from Pontiac been visiting today, and sister's got a headache and don't feel like driving home, so they're going to stay all night. The two oldest kids' bedtime ain't until 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and 
Mr. Donahue's got a Kansas City freight drag at 11, and he just come in off in a freight drag at 6, so he wants to catch a little sleep. I hear some interloper in the kitchen. I said he was welcome to come lay down on Russia's bed and nap. Hey, I'm always glad just to a do the... Hey! Hey! Hello, Vic. Well, we got still more guests. Come on in, Uncle Fletcher. I was afraid I might bust in on you while you was eating supper. Oh, finished supper long ago. Right. Saw a rush out in front just now. Did you? Uh huh. Evening, Vic. Evening, sir. You look healthy, hearty, happy, and handsome. Yes, yes, I do. Hope you don't mind me coming in the back door without knocking, Sadie. Of course not. You're not company. No, I'm not company or anybody, but Paul well, likes to give warning before he busts in on people. The way I figure, though, is if I did knock on the back door, you'd have to get up and walk all the way out in the kitchen and let me in. Sure. Take a chair, Uncle Fletcher. Thanks. Staying home this evening, are you? Uh-huh. Fine. Miss Brighton and Willard are dropping past after bed for a little visit, and Vic's got a couple of men from the lodge coming by. Company, huh? Oh, not really. Miss Brighton and Willard are old, comfortable, easy friends, and Vic's callers are just looking in to talk over lodge business a while. Hope I haven't gone to work and put my foot in it. Why? Well, I'll tell you. Maybe I took too much on myself. My landlady's married daughter and her man worked our house for supper this evening. You haven't met him, I guess, Sadie. No. Heard you talk about him considerable, though. Mr. and Ms. Upscotch? Yes, Everett and Florence. They're at our house for supper tonight, and we all got talking. Florence said she'd like to Another meet. Another interloper in the kitchen, kiddo. Uh, excuse me, Uncle Fletcher. Mr. Donahue. Yes. Just me, ma'am. All right. Uncle Fletcher's in here, George. Yes, I'm in a martyr. Join you in just a minute. He's a good boy. Oh. Mm. Where'd you put the box of graham crackers, ma'am? Why? Where'd you put the box of graham crackers? You're not eating already. No, I'm just wondering where the graham crackers are. He only just finished supper half an hour ago. He's a good boy. Rush is all right. Uh, what'd you start to say about Miss Keller's daughter and her man? I hope I never took too much on myself. Well, uh, why? Well, we were having supper and talking about different junk. Fort said she'd like to beat my niece I brag so much about, and Abbott said he would too. And I, I guess I told tales out of school because I... Invited your movie. Beg pardon, Vic? <laughs> I finished your sentence for you. Why? I said you invited your landlady's kids over. That's exactly what I've done. You see, Everett and Fort come right up Virginia Avenue here on their way home, and I said, I bet you people be pleased if they drop you the mix. Oh, hello, Rush. You're the same fellow I said hello to out in front of it to go, ain't you? <laughs> yep. Fine. No, Sadie, we were all sitting around the supper table, and Ford says, I'd like to meet your niece, Sadie, and her family you talk so much about. Well, they're welcome as can be. And I said, well, I'll bet they'd like to meet you and Abbott. Sure. I said, you go right past Beckham, Sadie's house there on Virginia Avenue. Why don't you stop in on your way home? Well, you told him exactly right. You people got other company, though. More than me. Fine. Mom, I couldn't find that box of graham crackers. Are you telling me you're hungry? They're for the kids after a while. No, Florence and Everett been here to be talked so much kids? about Excuse you. me, Uncle Fletcher. Fine. What kids? Bluetooth and Leland and Vernon. Don't you remember telling oh, me that? Oh, my, 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 my. What new complication is oh, this? I give him permission to invite kids in to study algebra. Mm-hmm. Bluetooth Johnson, Leland Richards, and Vernon Pagels. Bluetooth, Leland, and Vernon are good boys. Bluetooth, Leland, and Vernon are all right. Oh, Mr. Don, who's coming over to take a nap in your bed? Yeah? He can't do any sleeping with you four roustabouts up there. I <laughs> give him our bed, see? He generally balks at using our bed. Figures he's making more housework and stuff for me if he uses the big bedroom. Well, what alternative is there? <laughs> None that I can think of. Oh. I'd forgot all about them three boys coming to study algebra. No, Sadie. We were sitting around the supper table there, and I was telling Florence and Emma to Well, you've done exactly right. We'll enjoy meeting Mr. and Ms. Upscotch. Uh-huh. Rush with Mr. Donahue upstairs. You kids will have to be quiet. Okay. I mean that now. No roughhousing. No wrestling matches. No seeing who can twist the other one's leg around Telephone somebody. Telephone needs to get. Telephone needs to get. Oh, okay, Probably Smelly Clark wanting to join the algebra game. Smelly's a good boy. Hello. Oh, yes, Fred. Hey, hey. Oh, ha-ha. Uh-huh. Uh, well, Fred, I don't guess we can play any 500 this evening. It just so happens... 
What? Oh. Oh. Oh, I see. Well, mercy, in that case, you come too. Sure. Sure. All right, Fred. All right. Goodbye. Don't uh, tell me our lonely evening is to be brightened up with company. (laughs) Fred found out he didn't have to put in overtime at the foundry. and Ruthie was over at Evan's house, and he got in touch with her there and told her he'd meet her here. She's already on her way. Hmm? Hey. Oh, as long as she was coming, I said he might as well come. Hmm. Well, we got company this evening, Uncle Fletcher. Why? Let's name over our company. All right. Steve Chestbutter and A.J. Spence in the kitchen. Vernon Peggles, Leland Richards, and Bluetooth Johnson in my bedroom. Uh, Donna here in our bedroom. Miss Brighton and Willard, Mr. and Ms. Upscotch, Fred and Ruthie, and Uncle Fletcher down here. Makes uh, 13 guests, all told. And counting the three of us, it makes a grand total of 16 people in the house. <laughs> well, like Uncle Fletcher says, fine. But pardon, Sadie? I say fine. Fine, fine. <laughs> Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. And there we leave. Chris goes Vic and Sade until the next time. Can you use $2,500? Remember, Chris goes second and final double cash contest offers a $2,500 grand prize and 125 other cash prizes. See your Crisco dealer for official contest blanks with complete rules and instructions on how to double any prize you win in Crisco's double cash contest. And don't forget to listen to Crisco's Vic and Save the next time. This is Mel Allen speaking. $2,500 was sure a bunch of big bucks back then. That's some contest that they were holding over there with their Sure Mix Crisco. Oh, man. And uh, that poem, I, just one line in a poem, I can only imagine how many duplicate entries they had. Uh, I'm very curious. I mean, was the fix in? Uh, I hate to be cynical, but the really now. Or that maybe it was like a 50-way tie or something. And once again, I just have to note, I love that organ music that is used on the Vic and Sage show. It, it's just so good um to hear it's it's like a, a organ just an old radio it's just such a happy warm feel i'd love to have an organist here just kind of spicing it up that that uh, that yeah like like i guess they still do that or used to do it at baseball stadiums when i was a kid but now everything's canned isn't it i mean i haven't been to a ball game in a million years but I don't think they actually have a human being playing the organ like they used to. Dun, 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 dun. Let's go, team. Uh, and the Vic and Sage show itself. Th- th- what a crowd. Those one-sided phone calls, which were a staple. I mean, and you got to know, know the people on the other side by the way, like, it's, everybody reacted to them. Uh, the way Sadie reacted to Ruthie her best friend, um, the way Rush has all of these crazy friends who called. And and this is like a night at the opera. Before a night at the opera, all of a sudden there's, what, 18 people going to be in the small house halfway up in the next block? Uh, Just a little utter chaos. And all of these people, all of these people, all we ever heard except for one unfortunate incident with a, a couple called the Brain Feebles, which, I don't know, I might include an episode just as a, an example, but these dotty Brain Feeble may be the most annoying character in the history of radio, period. 
Um, I'm not sure why they were added. I'm sure there was a reason. Uh, I doubt it was something that Paul Reimer wanted to do, but all we ever hear on the classic Vic and Sade episodes are Vic, his wife Sade, that genial and senile Uncle Fletcher saying, fine, fine, and uh, their son Rush, who uh, during World War II, Rush had to go into the army, Bill Idelson, because he was actually, he'd been a kid on the radio since 1932, and he was old enough to be drafted and went off to the war, I believe, in late 42, early 43, and was replaced by young Russell without much being said about it, and it seems to work, although young Russell is definitely a younger kid and not quite as accomplished a writer, a performer, rather. And it's still, it's Paul Reimer's writing, performed well. So when we get to those, I, you don't need to worry too much. And yeah, did what, what a great show. And I hope, again, you're digging this as much as I am. And uh, as promised, we should kick in the first chapter of our Murray Leinster book. Part one of The Grandfather's War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This story was first published in Astounding Science Fiction, October 1957. The Grandfather's War by Murray Leinster, Part 1 No man can be fully efficient if he expects praise or appreciation for what he does. The uncertainty of this reward, as experienced, leads to modification of one's actions to increase its probability. If a man permits himself the purpose of securing admiration, he tends to make that purpose primary and the doing of his proper work secondary. This costs human lives. Manual, Interstellar Medical Service, pages 17 and 18. The little med ship seemed absolutely motionless when the hour off warning whirred. Then it continued to seem motionless. The background noise tapes went on, making the small, unrelated sounds that exist unnoticed in all places where human beings dwell but which have to be provided in a ship in overdrive so a man doesn't go ship-happy from the dead stillness. The hour-off warning was notice of a change in the shape of things. Calhoun put aside his book, the manual of the med service, and yawned. He got up from his bunk to tidy ship. Murgatroyd the Tormal opened his eyes and regarded him drowsily without uncoiling his furry tail from about his nose. I wish, said Calhoun critically, that I could act with your realistic appraisal of facts, Murgatroyd. This is a case of no importance whatever, and you treat it as such, while I fume whenever I think of its futility. We are a token mission, Murgatroyd, a politeness of the med service, which has to respond to hysterical summonses as well as sensible ones. Our time is thrown away. Murgatroyd blinked somnolently. Calhoun grinned wryly at him. The med ship was a fifty-ton space vessel, very small indeed in these days, with a crew consisting exclusively of Calhoun and Murgatroyd the Tormol. It was one of those little ships the med service tries to have called at every colonized planet at least once in four or five years. The idea is to make sure that all new developments in public health and individual medicine will spread as widely and as fast as can be managed. There were larger medcraft to handle dangerous situations and emergencies of novel form, but all medships were expected to handle everything possible, if only because space travel consumed such quantities of time. This particular journey, for example... An emergency message had come to sector headquarters from the planetary government of Phaedra II. 
carried on a commercial vessel in overdrive at many times the speed of light, it had taken three months to reach headquarters, and the emergency in which it asked aid was absurd. There was, said the message, a state of war between Phaedra II and Canis III. Military action against Canis III would begin very shortly. Med service aid for injured and ill would be needed. It was therefore requested at once. The bare idea of war, naturally, was ridiculous. There could not be war between planets. Worlds communicated with each other by spaceships, to be sure. But the Lordler interplanetary drive would not work save in unstressed space. And, of course, overdrive was equally inoperable in a planet's gravitational field. So a ship setting out for the stars had to be lifted not less than five planetary diameters from the ground before it could turn on any drive of its own. Similarly, it had to be lowered an equal distance to a landing after its drive became unusable. Space travel was practical only because there were landing grids, those huge structures of steel which used the power of a planet's ionosphere to generate the force fields for the docking and launching of ships of space. Hence, landing grids were necessary for landings, and no world would land a hostile ship upon its surface, but a landing grid could launch bombs or missiles as well as ships, and hence could defend its planet absolutely. So there could be no attacks and there could be no defense, so wars could not be fought. The whole thing's nonsense, said Calhoun. We'll get there, and we've been three months on the way, and the situation is six months old, and either it's all been compromised, or it's long forgotten and nobody will like being reminded of it. And we've wasted our time and talents on a thankless job that doesn't exist, and couldn't. The universe has fallen on evil days, Murgatroyd, and we are the victims." Murgatroyd leisurely uncurled his tail from about his nose. When Calhoun talked at such length, it meant sociability. Murgatroyd got up and stretched and said, Gee! He waited. If Calhoun really meant to go in for conversation, Murgatroyd would join in. He adored pretending that he was human. He and his kind imitated human actions as parrots imitated human speech. Murgatroyd frisked a little to show his readiness to, for talk. "'Chee, chee, chee,' he said conversationally. "'I notice that we agree,' said Calhoun. "'Let's clean up.' He began those small items of housekeeping which one neglects when nothing can happen for a long time ahead. Books back in place, files restored to order, the special data reels Calhoun had been required to study— Calhoun made all neat and orderly against landing and possible visitors. Presently the breakout clock indicated twenty-five minutes more in overdrive. Calhoun yawned again. As an interstellar service organization, the Met Service sometimes had to do rather foolish things. Governments run by politicians required them. Yet Met Service representatives always had to be well informed on problems which appeared. During this journey, Calhoun had been ordered to read up on the ancient insanity once called the art of war. He didn't like what he learned about the doings of his ancestors. He reflected that it was lucky that such things couldn't happen any more. He yawned again. He was strapped to in the control chair a good ten minutes before the ship was due to return to a normal state of things. He allowed himself the luxury of still another yawn. He waited. The warning tape whirred a second time. A voice said, When the gong sounds, breakout will be five seconds off. There was a heavy, rhythmic tick-tocking. It went on and on. Then the gong and a voice said, Five, four, three, two... It did not complete the count. There was a tearing, rending noise and the spitting of an arc. There was the smell of ozone. 
The med ship bucked like a plunging horse. It came out of overdrive two seconds ahead of time. The automatic emergency rockets roared, and it plunged this way, and changed course violently, and plunged that, and seemed to fight desperately against something that frustrated every maneuver it tried. Calhoun's hair stood on end until he realized that the external field indicator showed a terrific artificial force field gripping the ship. He cut off the rockets as their jerkings tried to tear him out of his chair. There was stillness. Calhoun rasped into the space phone. What's going on? This is Med Ship Asclepus 20. This is a neutral vessel. The term neutral vessel was new in Calhoun's vocabulary. He'd learned it while studying the manners and customs of war in overdrive. Cut off those force fields. Murgatroyd shrilled indignantly. Some erratic movement of the ship had flung him into Calhoun's bunk, where he'd held fast to a blanket with all four paws. Then another wild jerking threw him and the blanket together into a corner, where he fought to get clear, chattering bitterly the while. "'We're non-combatants!' snapped Calhoun, another new term. A voice growled out of the space phone speaker. "'Set up for light-beam communication,' it said heavily. "'In the meantime, keep silence.' Calhoun snorted. But a med ship was not an armed ship. There were no armed vessels nowadays, not in the normal course of events. But vessels of some sort had been on the watch for a ship coming to this particular place. He thought of the word blockade, another part of his education in the outmoded art of war. Canis III was blockaded. He searched for the ship that had him fast. Nothing. He stepped up the magnification of his vision screens. Again, nothing. The sun Canis flamed ahead and below, and there were suspiciously bright stars, which by their coloring were probably planets. But the med ship was still well beyond the habitable part of a Sol-class sun's solar system. Calhoun pulled a photocell out of its socket and waited. A new and very bright light winked into being. It wavered. He stuck the photocell to the screen, covering the brightness. He plugged in its cord to an audio amplifier. A dull humming sounded. Not quite as clearly as a space phone voice, but clear enough, a voice said, If you are Medship Asclepus 20, answer by light beam, quoting your orders. Calhoun was already stabbing another button, and somewhere a signal lamp was extruding itself from its recess in the hull. He said irritably, I'll show you my orders, but I do not put on performances of dramatic readings. This is the devil of a business. I came here on request to be a ministering angel or a lady with a lamp or something equally improbable. I did not come to be snatched out of overdrive, even if you have a war on. This is a med ship. The slightly blurred voice said as heavily as before, This is a war, yes. We expected you. We wish you to take our final warning to Canis Three. Follow us to our base and you will be briefed. Calhoun said tartly. Suppose you tow me. When you dragged me out of overdrive, you played the devil with my power. Murgatroyd said, Chee! and tried to stand on his hind legs to look at the screen. Calhoun brushed him away. When acknowledgment came from the unseen other ship and the curious cushiony drag of the towing beam began to be felt, he cut off the microphone to the light beam. Then he said severely to Murgatroyd, What I said was not quite true, Murgatroyd, but there is a war on. To be neutral, I have to appear impressively helpless. That is what neutrality means. But he was far from easy in his mind. Wars between worlds were flatly impossible. The facts of space travel made them unthinkable. But yet there seemed to be a war. Something was happening anyhow, which was contrary to all the facts of life in modern times. And Calhoun was involved in it. 
It demanded that he immediately change all his opinions and all his ideas of what he might have to do. The Met Service could not take sides in a war, of course. It had no right to help one side or the other. Its unalterable function was to prevent the needless death of human beings. So it could not help one combatant to victory. On the other hand, it could not merely stand by, tending the wounded, and by alleviating individual catastrophes, allow their numbers to mount. This, said Calhoun, is the devil. Gee, said Murgatroyd. The med ship was being towed. Calhoun had asked for it, and it was being done. There should have been no way to tow him short of a physical linkage between ships. There were force fields which could perform that function. Landing grids used them constantly. But ships did not mount them. Not ordinary ships, anyhow. That fact bothered Calhoun. Somebody's gone to a lot of trouble, he said, scowling, as if wars were coming back into fashion and somebody was getting set to fight them. Who's got us, anyhow? The request for med service had come from Phaedra too. But the military action, if any, had been stated to be due on Canis III. The flaming nearby sun and its family of planets was the Canis solar system. The odds were, therefore, that he'd been snatched out of overdrive by the Phaedron fleet. He'd been expected. They'd ordered him not to use the space phone. The local forces wouldn't care if the planet overheard. The invaders might. Unless there were two space fleets in emptiness jockeying for position for a battle in the void. But that was preposterous. There could be no battles in unstressed space where any ship could flick into overdrive flight in the fraction of a second. Murgatroyd, said Calhoun querulously, this is all wrong. I can't make head or tail of, of anything, and I've got a feeling that there is something considerably more wrong than I can figure out. At a guess, it's probably a Phaedron vessel that's hooked onto us. They didn't seem surprised when I said who I was. He checked his instrument board. He examined the screens. There were planets of the yellow sun, which now was nearly dead ahead. Calhoun saw an almost infinitely thin crescent, and knew that it was the sunward world toward which he was being towed. Actually, he didn't need a tow. He'd asked for it for no particular reason except to put whoever had stopped him in the wrong. To injure a med ship would be improper even in war, especially in war. He went back to the external field dial. There was a force field gripping the ship. It was of the type used by landing grids, a type impractical for use on shipboard. A grid to generate such a force field had to have one foot of diameter for roughly every ten miles of range. A ship to have the range of his captor would have to be as big as a planetary landing grid, and no planetary landing grid could handle it. Then Calhoun's eyes popped open, and his jaw dropped. Murgatroyd, he said appalled. Confound them, it's true. They found a way to fight. Wars had not been fought for many hundreds of years, and there was no need for them now. Calhoun had only lately been studying the records of warfare in all its aspects and consequences, and as a medical man he felt outraged. Organized slaughter had not seemed a sane process for arriving at political conclusions. The whole galactic culture was based upon the happy convictions that wars could never happen again. If it was possible, they probably would. Calhoun knew humanity well enough to be sure of that. Gee, said Murgatroyd inquiringly. You're lucky to be a Tormal, Calhoun told him. You never have to be ashamed of your kind. The background information he had about warfare in general made him feel skeptical in advance about the information he would presently be given. It would be what used to be called propaganda, given him under the name of briefing. It would agree with him that wars in general were horrible, but it would most plausibly point out with deep regret that this particular war, 
fought by this particular side was both admirable and justified. Which, said Calhoun darkly, I wouldn't believe even if it were true. End of part one. So stay tuned. There's two more chapters that will be included in this specific showcase episode. And next time we'll have the other three. Six chapters with a novella of science fiction. And an enjoyable one at that. Linster is a fine and entertaining sci-fi writer who I have a great appreciation for. And uh, together we're going to turn the clock back. I've been meaning to get some good Frank Edward Nora into the mix, and I think this time around we are going to check out one of his uh, overnight scapes. But this is a special one because basically what we're about to hear from, uh, let's see, what's the date here? October 14th, 2016, an episode called Local Adventure. And uh, what this consists of is... Frank, exploring his, uh, where he lives in Nutley, New Jersey. What a name, huh? Nutley. Um, having an exploration and lots of talk with Manny, who we heard last time, Manny the Mailman, Manny Fortunato, and Rule from the Netherlands, who was visiting, and he at least used to regularly visit and do uh, appearances on the overnightscape. He turns up on the exit ramp now and then. Just one of the uh, many uh, people who are associated and part of the big overnight scape underground family that uh, has embraced me. And I don't know, uh, getting in and out of the groove here as far as like sometimes I really feel it. And I'm really like going and talking and grooving with the whole thing. And uh, then there's the other times. But that we keep this showcase going and i hope you're enjoying it. this is a longer than normal segment because i said there would be but uh i am not going to include the other side segment at the end of uh, almost every overnight skate show frank includes this wonderful collection that at some point i should uh include one with the whole other side. All kinds of found Creative Commons audio, much like the tapestries and kind of like a compressed version of what we're doing here. But indeed, let's sit back together and uh, go back in time and uh, have a nice walkabout in Nutley, New Jersey with the trio of Frank Edward Nora, Manny the Mailman, and Rule. All right, so we're here in uh, on the streets of Nutley, New Jersey. I'm with Rule from the Netherlands. Hi there. And Manny the Mailman. Manny, I'm back again. So this is the mini adventure in Nutley. We're walking. Uh, this is a part of my town I've never walked around before. We're, we we just had uh, dinner at a lovely restaurant. What was it called? Uh, Michael's Pasteria. <laughs> and I had pasta. I had some uh, ravioli. It was very good. What did you have? Uh, I had uh or a cheddar with broccoli arab and sausage. Nice. And I have the veal salt and bocca. What is it? What? The veal salt and bocca. Oh, here's veals. a vape shop, Frank. <laughs> Here, yep, here's vaping. Let's check it out. <laughs> now, this is the vape escape, sort of like the overnight escape. So we, we've been talking about on the shows you know, how vaping has become so popular. The vape escape. So uh, the also, hour, also one to nine. In the you see a lot of people vaping. Really? So this is like a booming business all over the world. You're going to have to surmise that vapors don't wake up early. <laughs> yeah, 1 to 9. Early. And uh, uh, what is this? The juice clearance. Yeah, so make... what do they call it? The juice is the liquid you put in yes, it? Or... I guess. And a lot of people make their own. Like my son does it vaping, and he has friends that mix their own juices. Oh, look. Here's, here's the, the... They actually are explaining it. Getting started. <laughs> what is an e-cigarette? An e-cig is a battery-powered vaporizer which has the feel of tobacco smoking but does not produce cigarette smoke. Rather, a misty vapor. No tar, no smoke, no smell. No smell? No taste? Like, what is it, just like air? What is e-liquid? I don't believe there's no smell. I, there is must, a smell. Yeah, there's definitely a smell. E-liquid is often sold in pre-filled disposable cartridges or bottles. There are hundreds of flavors. 
all available in different nicotine strength or concentrations of e-liquid. E-liquids are manufactured with various tobaccos, fruits, and many other flavors, and even come in nicotine-free versions. Right, I hear a lot of people are smoking but without nicotine. It's just for the flavor. All our e-liquids are made right in the lab. <laughs> what? <laughs> and all our... They, they, what are they, the, the lab right here? Uh, and how does it work? How much does it cost? The way an e-cig works is through a small heating element located in the atomizer inside your tank. The e-liquid is soaked up by the wicks, which allow juice to get to the coils and vaporize. Starter kits cost from $25 to $50, depending on the battery tank and your choice. Wow. And there you can see the first dollar they ever made is there by the counter. Yeah, and it looks a little, the windows look a little bit like Well, they, yeah, yeah, I mean, it looks like, yeah, very smoky. They're saying the vape doesn't do that. So there's a, there's a little counter with two uh, very ratty-looking yeah. stools. <laughs> looks like they picked them off out of the garbage yeah. heap. And um, there's a little, yeah, so behind the counter, I guess you have little stained, bottles. Stained carpet. Stained carpet. It's a pretty cheap business to run, you know. It's just like, wow, I like the vape escape. They have a hookah over there, isn't that yeah. like a hookah? Real? Oh, hookah, wow. So I guess they, they do other stuff, too. Yeah, they do real smoking with hookahs, yeah. And they have to clean the floor. There's a lot of trash on it. I know. This place is, is filthy. <laughs> What's going on with the vape escape? We got Mama Victoria. I can't believe this is my... I live in this town, but I'm totally unfamiliar with all this stuff. This is the other side of town. I don't even know my side of town. <laughs> is, this, is this the upside or? I don't know. This is like, I don't know what side this is. So, Ruel, we last we last talked to you several years ago. Yeah, that must have been t two years ago, I guess. Three, it might maybe have been three. even. I think it the was Brooklyn three. Adventure, right? Yeah. That's the last time. So, how have you been, Ruel? What have you been up to? I've, I've been fine. Busy, working. Not, not so much vacation. <laughs> no? No. So, how long are you here in New Jersey for? Uh, just two days. Just two days, oh, wow. Three days. Uh, well, Saturday and Sunday. And today and but today is a travel day and Monday is a travel day. Wow. And Football then and days. then you're going back to Boston? Yeah. And then uh, Monday after back home. Nice back to so no no you live in what weeks. Eindhoven? Or? Yes. Eindhoven in the Netherlands? Yes. yes. Yeah. Now are there states in Netherlands? Like here we have New Jersey, New York, oh, yeah. are there states? Provinces. So what province do you live in? In North Brahmant. North North Brahmant? Eindhoven, North Brahmant. Yeah. And how how many provinces do you have? We have twelve. Really? Twelve. Don't don't ask me. Almost like the Canada. Don't ask me does, doesn't Canada have like twelve? Around twelve, know. right? Yeah, I think so. Now I But we like also have some overseas parts of the Netherlands, of course. Uh, like the Dutch East, East Indies? Curaçao, Curaçao and, yeah. and uh, Saba and couple of islands really but the east indies no, no longer no okay they, they, they got you they, they got free yeah so now of course i was asking you before about some stuff like uh we're in the middle of this for those of you in the future we're in the final weeks of this donald trump versus hillary clinton election and we just had the uh the worst part of it recently with the, the pussy grabbing stuff and everything did you see that one of the animal shelters their new, uh, their new slogan is grab, 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 a, grab pussy, a pussy, pussy. <laughs> adopt a cat, yeah. you know. So from, from a European perspective, are you just over there laughing at us every day, like uh, the ridiculousness is going on in this country? Well, I guess like everybody, or like most people I speak here in the U.S., you never would have thought it would have come to this point that you, that you as a nation had to decide between Clinton and Trump to decide who's yeah. going to be president. It seems almost unbelievable. One of them will be president. Probably Hillary, as they're saying. Yeah. That's, I guess, what most people in Europe hope for. We don't want Clinton having his finger on the nuclear weapons. Yeah. You mean Trump? Trump, I Trump. Trump, sorry. Let's go down this way. There's a, There used to be an ice cream place over here. Oh, yeah, to read I'll say now. one thing about this, this whole election. It's hard to tell what's real. Like, like the show that never dies Saturday Night Live has been parroting yeah. all the debates and things and sometimes it's hard to tell which is real and which isn't because yeah. it's bizarre these these debates are ridiculous especially this the second one i felt like just really was out of control oh here's rita's it's not closed though oh you know well, there was is it out of business or what's going on here it looks kind of it looks like they might be uh shut for the season yeah i think it could be yeah because this just used to be uh, applegate farms it sells happiness yeah <laughs> 
happiness. But there's there's kind of a there's a cool little like uh, convenience store over here we should go oh, to. Wow. It, hidden the convenience store. You know yes. more about your town than your. <laughs> See, even 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 on a mini adventure, we can go to some some strange places. Now, this place open? Up. I don't know. <laughs> it may be. We should go buy something. Wait, I I, I don't have any money left. We brought we brought Ruben to a Seven Eleven. He and he got some coffee, pumpkin coffee. Yeah. This is a recap of the seven hours. Show. Yeah. <laughs> this will be a little shorter than seven hours. For people who missed it. Let's go in. Good evening. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hey, look, weird New Jersey. Yeah, just a new episode just came out. Yeah. All right, let's see what we're going to get here. Different smell. What's the smell? Uh, oh, it's kind of like mothballs. Uh, yeah? Yeah, right? Okay. Let's see what I'm going to get here. Yeah, I'm all out of cash, though. Okay. What are we gonna candy get? Candy should be the sampling. Well, there's always the sugar daddy, but that'll like, you know, it's very, it's very. Uh, Somebody was telling me they have uh, anything. Reese's. Anything you haven't tried before, Frank? Mm, I don't know. I've tried most of these. Chuckles are always good. Well, we can buy some chuckles. Just sample some chuckles. Crackle. That's interesting. That, that's a rare one to find. Yeah. But, oh, and they have Mr. Good Bar. It's amazing. I've been yeah, always looking for Mr. Good Bar. And take five. Oh, wow. This is this is the stuff I've been looking for. Yeah, we talked about that at the <laughs> Yeah. This is the only store that has it. Wow. I can't believe I'm holding a take five. Wow. Oh, Special flavors. All right. Check it out. M&M's. Almond. Nice. Almond. Very nice. Look at that Comic that books. Magazine stands that used to be loaded and there's hardly anything left in it. Ooh, a Cohiba. And if you can spot me a few bucks, I ran out of money. Thank you. You hear that the Cuban cigars are, uh, you can't buy them anymore here, but people can take back as many as they want now. Oh, really? They don't? Yeah, See, they left at the BAM today? Yeah, well, just on no. someone going there and bringing it back. Okay. Well, they have, they'll eventually sell them here, right? I hope so. Then you get real Cohiba. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someday. Real Cohiba. Cool. Oh. So, yeah, there's a... Uh, Fun little store. It's just this place is just called Food Store, <laughs> as you can see General. from the sign. Let's see where this food Store. So now it smelled like mothballs. Quick, quick, huh? buy, up quick here. buy. Okay. It used to be quick buy. <laughs> Open till midnight. So you got to experience a strange little store in in uh, Nutley here. It's, it did smell like mothballs in there, or something, right? What, how else would you describe that smell? It's just, yeah, it definitely was a. Well, you think they have a moth problem? Why do they? There's <laughs> mothballs in there. What did they say? Sicky sweet, sickly sweet. Yeah. Eesh. All right, here we go. Our last day will be October 10th. Huh. So, if, yeah, for the season. Wow. Bloomfield Avenue will be open. I guess they make enough money uh, over the summer to be in got, business. We only got till Sunday, Bloomfield Avenue. I know. I know, right? There's a yogurt place up the road. Yeah, maybe we'll go to the yogurt place. Shoe repair. You don't see a lot of that anymore. So really, I, I know, shoe repairs. I also wanted to ask you about Brexit, right? So you were a lot closer to that than we were. <laughs> what are your views on the, the Britain leaving the uh, European Union? No, nobody expected it. No? Nobody expected it. And, and I even heard, well, you probably heard it here too, but people, kids just voting for Brexit, for Brexit yeah. just for fun. Because <laughs> they thought it wouldn't. No, not I guess we'll go this way. Not thinking about what the consequences would be. And wow. We'll see. Now, I heard, I heard that some Dutch politicians are trying to get another, like, Dutch exit. You heard about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, Is it's, that going to happen? Or? I don't think so, but... Yeah. As, as in most countries, there are a lot of people who are fed up with the government and 
they'll they'll just phone on anything as long as it's anti. Yeah. We had we had a referendum about um, a treaty, uh, hand, uh, a treaty the, the EU is going to make with Ukraine. Yeah. And Holland voted against it. Really? It's still going on. <laughs> but it's it wasn't about the referendum anymore. It was just a vote against <laughs> against the government. Wow. Everyone's very angry all around the world. Have you noticed that? Yes. <laughs> I'm so angry. Now, I have a question because I have to claim in ignorance. Who's who's in charge in the Netherlands? Who's your leader? We have, we have Rutte. Prime Minister Rutte. See, now we know nothing about him here, <laughs> no. but you know or her. You, 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 you might have heard of one Dutch politician. Geert Wilders. He's, he's pretty anti-Islam. Okay, uh, and and he's been here a couple of times and spoke. But your elections could go off. We he's, don't hear he's nothing. He's one about politician it. in in, in uh, uh, one of the few politicians in Holland who is pro-Trump. Really, he loves <laughs> Trump. Huh? That's pretty wild. <laughs> he wants he wants to build a wall too, I guess. Well, that's true because there's been this uh, the influx of uh, refugees from Syria and stuff there. So how now has that impacted uh, the Netherlands at all? Yeah, we had some pretty bad. Um, uh, where they, uh, where the town had a meeting, if they should accept yeah. the refugees, should there be, and that was disrupted by right-wing nuts who think. Oh wow! So a lot of a lot of that happening, but I think everybody, everything has settled down now. And I haven't heard about it in no, recent. The Trump has taken over from all the refugees. Yeah, there's not. Well, the, the, actually, there aren't that many refugees coming in at the moment. Mainly yeah. because some of the outer uh, borders of uh, Europe have have closed their borders. Okay. So, so they, the, they, they they can get in, but um, I think it's everything. They come and then it dies down. Yeah, they make a big deal out of it. Yeah. And then, then like yeah. two weeks later, and everyone forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Just like here, I guarantee you. Like once the election's over, there'll be something else. Another. Yes. Like some celebrity will get married or something, or get divorced, and then we'll forget about Trump I, in two I, weeks. Aren't uh, uh, Brad and, uh, and Angelina getting a yeah. divorce? Yeah, <laughs> that's the big news. Yeah, <laughs> great. Oh. All right, let's keep going here. Let's see what we can. very New Jersey thing. Just seeing a hubcap. A hubcap on, on the side of the, on a sign. Now, what is this? This is the, uh, the yogurt place, and then there's also a yogurt. Isn't there like a, a the isn't there like a donut place or this looks like a pretty cool place though. Want to get a yogurt? Uh, yeah, let's get a yogurt. In the Yo Lounge or TGBY? I think we're gonna go for the lounge. <laughs> Yo Lounge. All right. it sounds too noisy in here to record, but we'll, we're gonna have some ice cream or some uh, yogurt, and then we'll be back. Okay. All right, it's not that loud in here actually. Hi. Hi. All right. So I think we. Uh, yeah. What, what is it? What did you say? Nut gnocchi? Oh, the nutley. Oh, that looks good. Nice. All right, we'll be back in a moment. Yeah. All right, we're in the yogurt lounge. We got our yogurt. I got the um, espresso and uh, taro with a uh, chopped butterfingers and uh, kiwi bobas, which I guess is like those little. Uh, Fish eggs. Fish eggs, yeah, great, thank you. I'm, e I'm eating a fish row, kiwi row. What do you get, Manny? I have red velvet and then a little bit of cappuccino. Oh, nice. With nothing on it. So nothing on it, no toppings? I was playing. Salted caramel, coconut, and uh, walnuts in, in maple syrup, and. Um, oh, Reese's peanut butter. I thought it was caramel, but it turned out to be. Peanut butter chips. Peanut butter, nice. So what is? Let me try this boba. It's like it's it's like the little it's like the stuff you have in the. Um... Oh wow! What is that? What is boba? It's not like the little thing. The things in the tea. It's different. I thought they were the things from tapioca. No, it's not tapioca. It's like you bite it and it and the the liquid shoots into your mouth. Boba. I hope it's not. Doesn't have gelatin in it. Too late now. Taro, of course, is getting very popular around here. It was unknown a few years ago, right? Taro. You do have boba tea. Yeah, in 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 the where did we have that? 
We went to a when mall we were, when we were in uh, Queens. In Queens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember that, yeah. In the in, in, in the mall where there were a lot of in the Chinese. Yeah, history. yeah. Yeah, before we met Addy. That's true, yeah. yeah. Now if you're just hearing this for the first time, we have so many adventures you can go back and listen to, the three of us. Sometimes yeah. sometimes other people come along. We have a, at least six or seven different Yeah. This is our yogurt adventure. There was one where it was a two day event. We met the night before and then went on the next that was our first adventure, I think. Yeah. The, the overnight case uh, rescue. I think the first one was that we met in. We just met the evening. Yes. You after work, and we met before on. Uh, yeah, we went to that bar near the Trump Towers. Yeah, and we went to the no, bar. No, we wasn't near the Trump Towers. Or yeah, and then we uh, were watching them play tennis. Yeah, they had wheat tennis week. <laughs> over at Rockefeller Center. Wow. Yeah, that was a good adventure. We went. You took us to a lot of the, like, the depressing, the depressing uh, eating area, and the, oh yeah, we went up to some uh, elevated little areas where we used to have lunch. I don't even. Oh yeah, I always love taking people to depressing places. Famous, famous, famous place we went that was really cool was the Catherine Hepburn Garden. Oh yeah, that's a very cool place. The little, the little benches. And the little... Mm. Is that still thriving? Have you ever been back? To... I think so. I know it was it was it was being repaired for a while. I don't. I guess you have to repair a park. I don't know. But so let's try to describe where we are right now. We're in a lounge in my. This is in my town. I've never been here. Um, so there's like these uh, sectional couches, yeah, right? Like they found on the street. They're kind of dirty. <laughs> there's like a trend here. And uh, so there's there's a TV set showing a TV show. Hawaii Five O. Hawaii Five O. The new Hawaii Five O. There's kind of a a uh, lighting fixture up there, kind of mid-century modern style. Yeah, and there's like a, a oval above it. A purple oval above it. But it's kind of cool though. It's kind of low key, right? Yeah. It's it feels a little bit like a lounge. Now, what are those? What are those little things on the tables? Is that for you to hook your tablet up? Oh, I think they. A lot of these places do have iPads for you to use. Yeah, there's like iPads yeah. on every table. It's funny because I went to another one of these places. I think it's a, it's a yogurt tradition to give you an iPad to play with. Interesting. A, a free iPad, whatever. You... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how 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 does it taste? Is it good? I, my, mine is pretty good. Mm. And it's funny. There's a TCB right across the street, so there's competition. But I think this would be a little cooler. TCB would probably. Yeah, be... that's that, that's the, that's the past. This is the future. We have some. Of, we have a, like the red mango over by me is sort of yeah. set up like this. Like you pump your own. Yeah, and then you you load it up with stuff, and then you weigh it. Yeah. And you're paying about twelve dollars for your ice cream. I know, and then they say it's your fault. You put too much in. That's why it's so expensive. You know. <laughs> you see a lot of you see a lot more of frozen yogurt places over the last couple of years. Oh yeah. I mentioned red mango, and I think I saw another one, green, green something. Yeah. Yeah. This place here has way more flavors than the red mango by me. Really? Yeah, it's, I was surprised how it just kept going back and forth. It's like a boom in business. Well, you know, a lot of people, like, their dream is to open their own business. So a lot of people probably, they like a yogurt place would be like their dream to open a business. I would, I would be too, uh, whenever I think about stuff like that, I feel like, no, it would never work. It would go out of business. You see, I'm not a businessman. I have a negative view on things. <laughs> There's been, like, businesses by where I live that were, like, always doomed. No matter who moved in, they would, like, last about six months. And there was one place by me, maybe about eight different places went in over ten years. Yeah. And then this uh, place called Bina's, a Mexican restaurant, went in, and they've been there for 20 years. Man. Really? It's like the, it's the like right... What, was, what did they do different than all the other ones? It was the right combination of stuff. You never know. So what's the action on Hawaii Five-0? Uh, they had a big shootout. Everyone's yeah. dead. The funny thing about this Hawaii Five-0 is that they've... Uh, I do watch it sometimes, I'll admit. They've re recreated all the characters from the old one, but it's a totally different show. So, so that guy's Jack Lord? Yeah, Steve McGarrett is uh, this fella here. And then there's a Dano. It's uh, Scott Kahn, Mike, uh, Michael Kahn's son. Is it Michael Kahn from The Godfather? What was his 
Um, no, James, James Con, yeah. His son is Dano. They, do they say Bookham Dano? Yeah, they do. They do. Wow. But it's and this guy from Lost is on it. Oh, really? He's still around. Yeah, he's like a Hurley. Yeah, but it's just it's a totally different story and a totally different theme. But they have the names from the the '60s show. And there was actually an episode recently where Jack Lord. Jack Lord's ghosts appeared to Steve McGarrett. Really? But it made no sense because it was like there's no tie into the two. Really? Is Jack Lord still with us? Or he must be dead no, by he now. He passed away, but no. but it's an interesting show. And did they use the same theme song? Yes. <laughs> I, I didn't watch your one. I don't watch the new one. I watch it, but I'm I have the, I haven't really seen either either. It's just it's famous because of the song. Dun, 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 but was, but why why not yeah. like create new characters like? Why not make it Hawaii Five O Two Thousand or whatever? Like, why did they have to use those names? Because it has no tie-in. It's to like, appeal to you, I yeah. guess. So. <laughs> Nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. Well, my father liked the old show. I was a little kid when that was on, so. Yeah, I think I was a little, little watched, too young. Yeah. yeah you watched with, with, with the in, the, in the mid '60s. Yeah. yeah. Some free magazines. Kids on the go. It's one of those ones that gives you all the places you can bring the kids. Right. Maybe Very that sweet. place we went with Ruben is in there. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, we went to an indoor theme park in South Jersey. It was uh, not really South Jersey. What would you say? Free, freehold to Central Jersey, yeah. People are very sensitive about that around here. I talked to a bunch of guys I work with that have kids, like, like, early teens or younger and they all know of the place oh really they know so that I was like I said I went to this place it was real as soon as I mentioned it they told me what was the name of it again uh, I play I play as soon as I described it they said oh I play they knew it <laughs> it was enormous it had like it was like like an indoor boardwalk and arcade and they had roller coaster laser tag and then they had an adult section bar with pool tables and darts and then they had some kind of theater in the back that we couldn't even figure out with that. Yeah. One. Really interesting. Yeah, it was a big place. You never know what you'll find in New Jersey. Ruben and Clara must have spent 10, 10 or twelve dollars trying to win a a bootleg uh, sum sum. And it was no like, vampires this time. No vampires. <laughs> but the things were packed so tight in there there was no way to get them out. It was one of those claw claw machines, and no matter how the claw gripped it, it just came right out. It didn't work. They were like stuffed in. I don't think you could. I don't think you could pull them out with your hands. They no. Like, no vampires. No. Not like they when we were in New Brunswick. But we did go to New Brunswick. Yeah, we were in New Brunswick, and there was a banana. There was a guy. Dressed a guy dressed as a banana. As a banana. So instead of vampires, there were bananas. Oh, interesting. Well, to an addendum to that story, there was all the people dressed in the Michigan gear. Michigan played Rutgers. And uh, the coach of Rutgers had some derogatory statements over the winter. Really? And uh, so Michigan got a little upset and beat them 78 to nothing. Really? <laughs> oh, on the subject of sports, I, now, you're, what, now, what is your team in baseball? Uh, they were at Baltimore. Warriors. I saw that they were in the wild card, but they didn't make they it. They lost to a t- Toronto, yeah. They were were you upset? Yeah, because it went right to the last inning, and uh, the manager made a couple moves that we didn't like, and we could have won. But we'll did you hear, did you hear the game last night? It was the longest postseason game that only lasted nine in, innings oh, in history. It take forever. <laughs> it's like a four-hour baseball game. It's because they changed what they changed pitchers or something. Changed What's pitchers a lot. Plus they have a replay. Re, like the coaches could call for a replay on plays. So it's crazy. And they and I heard in D.C. the train system is all under construction, so everyone had to leave like real early to get the train home. <laughs> Meanwhile, it went until like like 1 a.m. or something. Yeah, they're, it's nuts going to these games. But the replay thing, this is this is the craziness of baseball's replay. They have a, like the umpires, if the manager doesn't like the call, he could call for a replay. So there's four umpires at the game. They go together, they get headphones on, and they have somebody in New York watching the videos on the ear, earpiece telling them what the call should be. And I'm like, they bring out a little box and stuff. And I'm like, why not just watch it and say to the umpire, this is the call. But they stand there for like 10 minutes 
What, what is there some like master umpire in New yeah, York? In New York, they watch it and they have all these different TV views. And really, but it takes forever. If they do it three or four times a game, you're talking about another thirty minutes. And and it seems to be like, why not just have the New York guy just make the decision and tell him? Wow. So I know baseball is suffering. Uh, it used to be the number one sport in America. And now it's behind football and, and basketball yeah, in popularity. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's still a little bit more popular than hockey, but not for me. Not yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's basically a group of old white men <laughs> watching baseball. Now. It's not very big with, like, the, the younger ethnic groups. And, like, you know, it's not a – maybe with, like, uh, like South Americans and stuff and, and Dominicans because they're – they're into it, but it's not. It doesn't have a big fan base with younger people. Years, football, the real football, will be. Oh, you I, you think soccer's going to take over here? I mean, I thought it would have been here already because anybody that's like under thirty-five grew up playing soccer here, but for some reason it still hasn't. There's a soccer league. There's a MLS. There's a soccer league, and there's a lot of teams, but and they do show a lot of European soccer in America now. But it still hasn't caught on. So I guess in the Netherlands, it's all about the real football. Yes. And any, like, there's no baseball or cricket or anything over there? Sorry? Any baseball or cricket? Uh, some baseball, probably some cricket also, but not not, 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 not much. Popular. Also, not baseball is not very popular. I would say... La- La- lacrosse? Any lacrosse no, in the no, no, Netherlands? No, no lacrosse, no okay. lacrosse. I guess would say the... Uh, football is popular uh, in the winter. Ice skating, but speed skating. No. How about uh, curling? No. Any curling? I love curling with the <laughs> with the brooms and stuff. Yeah. All right. I have to field, tell you field something. hockey. Field hockey is popular. Really? Well, what yeah. was the name of the areas in the Netherlands? You said you said it was provinces. Or? Yes. Okay. Now in Curacao. They, some of the greatest Major League Baseball players have come out of Curacao recently. And it's a tiny little place, but there's like three or four of the best players right now yeah. come from Curacao. Really? They actually won a Little League World Series one year. How, how does that happen that there's so many good players from that little island? It's not very big, right? It's Dutch. It's amazing. Right? So you're saying the Dutch are good at baseball, but they just don't know no. it? No. no. I don't know. Yeah, don't that know island has happens. produced some... For the size of it, there's like probably three of the top ten players in baseball come from Florida. So now what are you hoping for for the World Series? I see. I'd like the Cubs because they haven't won since like 19... But the Cubs and the Indians would be good because the yeah, Cubs, the Indians won. haven't won since 1948. No, neither one. I'd like to see that. I would have liked to have seen the Cubs and the Red Sox because yeah. there's a lot of tie-ins between the two teams, but the Red Sox got beat. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, I would say Cubs... Yeah, I think I'm. I think the fact that they've been waiting 108 years for a a, a win, you kind of have to root for them. It's a long time. Yeah, and they, uh, the times they got close, some kind of calamity happened. There was this guy who stuck his hand out one time when oh yeah, Bartman, and he just grabbed the ball when the guy was going to catch it. Then they lost the game. So they've had like they've gotten close, and something always happens. So I'm wondering if it's going to happen again. Do you watch football too, uh, Manus? Yes. What do you think about Brady? Uh, <laughs> he's a he's like one of the all time greats. I'm not a fan of the team, but he is. A, he's an all time great, but he had he just had to serve a four game suspension for deflating the football. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Deflate gate. Deflate gate. I, yeah. I, I was, it took a long time because that happened last. Last two years ago. Two years ago. Well, he, he got suspended last year, but then they got a lawyer and they had an appeal. Okay. And then, I, I remember being here for the plate gate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually paid a couple like of the team's interns. He gave the money to... In, so he really did do it. Yeah, well, each team's responsible for their own footballs, so that they like get the balls and the guy supposedly stuck a pin in the ball because he, he throws better if it's softer. Wow. Anything to win. Yes. You know. So this place is very interesting. It's a... Uh, He's a zillionaire. Well, too. Because I, uh, I stay in Massachusetts and near Boston. Oh, there. And the, big, and the big thing was last week was that... He came he, back, he, yeah. he came back. He played again. Yeah, he's a... Uh, he's like... He wasn't a... He wasn't like a... 
big prospect coming in. He was like a low draft pick, and he just got into it starting, and he's like probably going to break all the records. He's he's won more Super Bowls than most guys. He's, he's a pretty clutch guy, but I, I'm not a big fan. Yeah, you want to take off? No. He's almost done. So it's just... I'm getting in touch with my town. I feel so... It's great to get in touch with my town like this, you know? Here in Nutley. The popular place is pretty... Popular. I know. Look at this. I could... I mean, I could walk here in, like, 10 minutes, you know? Maybe question. 15. You, come back? you can take your no. wife here for a I won't come back. No? <laughs> I could, right? Yeah. I, I guess so. But, but, like, by the time I get home, I've been in New York City all day. I just need to rest. I need to lay down. and I need to sit down and watch TV. Watch TV. Plus, you probably passed by like 10 of these places in New York. Yeah, there's one in the uh, New York Times building, actually. Off the Wall, I think it's called. Yeah. It's weird. I neglect my hometown. But they might not have these beautiful couches with the... I know. I think they got the couches from the vape place. Yeah. Yeah, this stuff is uh, like hand-me-downs. This was good, though. Thank you. Yeah, it was pretty good. Let's, uh, let's continue on our way. See. Yo Lounge and Cafe. It's the Yo Lounge. This feels so weird. So maybe we'll walk down here a little bit. There's, I think there's some interesting stuff down here. Then we'll, we'll go back. Oh, yeah, we have some candy. I think we have to save them for later. I, I've had too much sweet stuff now. Uh, let's see. Little burger. Oh yeah, Lil Burgers. This has been here for a while. Yum yum, eat them up. That's closed, but they're still in there. Yeah, they're in there. They're they're cleaning up at the Little Burgers. What do we got here? Luna. Luna Woodfire Tavern. <laughs> a lot of these places are new. I mean, the other place. This this I think is relatively new. This looks like a place that opens up the doors when it's warm. Do they have like a like a menu No. And there's some sort of like stuffed cupcake place up here. Yeah, this is uh, what is this? The ginger. Uh, very very nice lighting uh, inside. Yeah. Nice fluorescent. Yeah, harsh fl- fl- fluorescent lighting at the uh, Chinese buffet. <laughs> Jeez. So yeah. Oh, the pretzel factory just opened. I do want to go there. That's that's a good place. The Philly Pretzel Factory. A lot of businesses here in Nutley. How about that one? Gone with the wing. Gone with the wing? Yeah, great. Play on words. And here, here's an interesting little alleyway. Wow. We should go down the alleyway. Let's see what's here. I think there's a very exciting parking lot on the other side. 100% smoke free. Ooh. You can't even smoke here. Look at the fish in the fish tank. Do you think they, they, they like, eat those fish? or? What is this place? It's, um, it's like a fusion place. Like I, I think I actually went there once or twice. Is this a parking lot for it? I think so. Yeah, we're looking inside an Asian fusion restaurant. Almost as exciting as New York City. I know. Isn't it exciting? We're, we're in an alleyway here. And here's a parking lot. I think the workers are hanging out there. And people. Nice. All right. See, this is, this is where you can park your car if you come here. And here's the back entrance to the other place. Right? Yeah, Ginger, Pan Asian restaurant. And this place is called Thai Essence Restaurant. It's a Thai restaurant. Yeah, I don't know. Like, my town does not really have the best restaurants. I mean, the place we went was all right, but there's an Indian place across the street whose name, who, uh, who shall remain nameless because I, I don't want to besmirch, besmirch their name. But I did take get takeout from there, and it was the worst Indian food I have ever eaten in my life. They shall remain nameless, even though they use a pretty good font. <laughs> I do like the I do like the font they used, but I don't like the food. They can almost make up for it with the font, but uh, we're getting, not quite. No, we're getting good good sound in this alleyway. Here. I know, like, echo. echo, echo. It's true. It's, it is actually uh, this alleyway is reflecting the sound. I've noticed Nutley likes to have their name in front of a lot of stores. Yeah, Nutley this, Nutley that. So this is the. Franklin, I think it's like a steakhouse. Yeah. 
Right. And here's here. This is Love Nutley. No, look. This 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 store was seen on the Today Show. Look at this. Wow. Fox News. Oh, the stuffed cupcakes. Okay, that was seen on Oprah, Rachel Ray, The New York Times, ABC Seven, Today Show, Cooking Channel, Fox News, and Oprah Magazine. I guess it's cupcakes with a kind of a cream on the inside. Right. Yes. Great. How does it look in there? Maybe they have savory fillings. Yeah, well, it could be. Now, when did HR Block become Block Advisors? Really? It's not HR okay. Block anymore. Yeah, look at that. I guess people didn't know what it was, so they need to say that they're right. advising you. And now it's Block Advisors. I have, I have to, I have to admit, I did go here a couple times. Did you? It was, it was uh, not, it was unnecessary. I'm sorry. I just, I just do my taxes on the computer now, and it's just fine. But I did go here a few times. I sat right down there, I think. And the guy, the guy did the same thing. He's just typing into the computer. He doesn't understand it. Radiology here. Erg. Huh? Erg. Erg. Yes, the uh, university radio. Maybe the university radiology group. And over here is, uh, yeah, right over here is used to be uh, the blockbuster. So this is this is history here. Oh, and talking about uh, this is uh, Scott trade. You can do some stock trading here. <laughs> like, what do they actually do here? You go in there and like I'd like I'd like to buy some shares of IBM. Like you just walk in. Is that how it works? There's another thing you could just do online. That's so why. Like why would you need to walk in here and like get, and get some stocks? I don't know. So yeah, this was the blockbuster. Oh, over here. This one right here, Sports Care. I want to look in here and imagine how it used to be Blockbuster Video. Oh, uh, you got a little view. Oh, they don't even let you look in. There's a little spot. See, there's all these exercise machines here, but it used to be Blockbuster. I remember wandering around trying to find a video to rent. They never had anything good. But that's the place you can't talk about. Yeah, but they have a great font called Tango. I love that font. Hari, yeah. Indian cuisine. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's an alternate name. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We're at the corner of William Franklin. Yeah. So well, we'll go up a little bit. I think this is the end of the um, exciting, the, like the main drag strip of the... Uh, and we're across the street park, so we can walk back. Yeah, we'll, we'll cross the, the street side. here. We have the attorneys at law, Pomaco, Ayaculo, Ayaculo, <laughs> Martino. <laughs> Bunch of O's at the end. Yeah. Of Look, they have a lovely balcony up there. They have an actual elevator in this building? Wow. Yeah. Is that, wow, that's very, very exciting. An actual elevator in a building. Is it open? Yeah. And there's a sign they printed out, please collect FedExes in rear of the building parking <laughs> How does this go? Please collect FedEx. Is that spelled wrong? In rear. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be no hyphen. There should yeah. be, just collect FedEx. You don't need the apostrophe S. In, that shouldn't be a capital I, rear of the building. Parking lot. Parking lot. Explanation point. <laughs> Thank you. That is some sign. Here's the great Warrico gas station. Never heard of that. There's all of these like these uh, independent gas stations, Warrico. I'm, I'm assuming it stands for World Oil Company. Uh, and what is yeah. this? What is this place up here? Place. We keep Subway. moving further and further into Nutley here. Subway. This reminds me of like having like I used to have weird adventures with Peter. We would walk around random towns in Pennsylvania. <laughs> this feels like a random town in Pennsylvania. Yeah, now there's another ice cream spot. Carvel. More ice cream, Carvel. For some reason, since uh, since Tom Tom died, I just I just have no taste for Carvel. This is the strangest. Subway Look at this with, with magazine rack and what is this? The Nut- Nutley it's newsstand. Oh, it's not a subway. No, it's, it's an, again, it's a very ramshackle, strange little store. Maybe they have. What are those Maybe greeting cards sandwiches. back there? Yeah, but it's. What's, what's wrong with yeah. my town? We have, but it's very unique stores though. It said subway on the side. But but everything's very ramshackle and sort of thrown together. Interesting. This is the new home of the Nutley Newsstand. What's well, the new home? <laughs> wow, look at all those magazines. A dollar twenty-five each. Wow. What's a boss, really? What's Boss Revolution? What do they? Have? They think they have used magazines. Only a dollar twenty-five each. <laughs> I like. Food is not allowed. <laughs> Great. I'm going to bring in my outside food to eat in the. Wow. This is very interesting. I've never really analyzed my town so much. Do not read magazines. But all the magazines are only a dollar twenty-five, so they're like used or something. But, but Frank, why would you buy magazines if you're not allowed to read them? That's true. I just like you know, you have to take it home, and you never can read it. That's wild. Wow, my town here. Oh, we have to find a good place to take a selfie. Yes. Maybe by a Warrico Gas. 
that might be a good place. Oh, there's the subway. There's okay. subway. Okay, there's subway. Okay. So that's just a normal subway restaurant. Yeah, yeah. Eat nice fresh. Now that's nice and neat. So. Yeah. They, well, because it's corporate control. Yeah. And, of course, the high school's right over there, so they have the student meal. I guess the kids in high school can come in for only $6, get a 6-inch sub, a 21-ounce f- fountain soda. That's not, that's not healthy for the kids. And chips are two cookies. Now, if anybody needs a job, they have a help wanted sign. That See? You can almost get half a bag of chips and one yeah. cookie. Yeah. Here's another alley that's very scary looking. A lot of alleys in Nutley. This is... Lacoste? What? Joshua Goldschmidt op- Optometric. People playing sports. They're Nike eyeglasses and Lacoste. better. What? Everything is so vague here. I don't. I don't get it. It's very. And, and it says use other door, but there is no other door. Oh, there. Okay, there is one over here. Okay. Well, I'll keep this in mind if I ever need more eyeglasses. Got here. Another physical therapy. What's wow. Physical wow, this is a big physical. I never even know I never even noticed this. Pro staff. Wow. Oh, you like know cutting edge barber shop. Ooh. I think I need a haircut. Maybe oh they're closed. It is nighttime after all. So yeah, I guess we can cross the street here as we've we've run out of interesting things to see. So yeah, that's the high school there and uh, the T D bank. Very exciting stuff. Now I hear the gas tax passed. Oh really? Oh great! Our tax. So we have November. such cheap gas here, yeah. and now now that they've they've taxed it because our gas is too cheap, they're going to tax like twenty three <laughs> cents a gallon. Yeah, so it's going to skyrocket in November. So Ugh. stock like like somebody we talked about, we should start stocking up. Stock <laughs> up, yeah. Stock up on gas. Yeah, and the Carvel is closed. Now you heard Tom Carvel was murdered, right? Oh yeah. He was murdered. They're still investigating it. They don't know what happened. Fudgy the whale. Fudgy, he was killed by Fudgy the whale. Co- what was the other guy? Cookie, Cookie Puss. Puss. Yeah. That's a Trump. That could be a Trump character. Yeah. <laughs> I went over and I grabbed the Cookie Puss uh, cake to, to have for my birthday party. Yeah. Uh, I miss Tom Carvel commercial. I know it was the best. No, but he was like you know he was retired, but uh, he was yeah. living with people and. They, was it somebody he worked that Yeah, worked for someone him? that was working for him or taking care of him, like they killed him, I think, to get his money. Yeah, I heard it's that. Really, you know, like they, they've, I don't know if ever they're going to ever solve it, I but. I totally forgot about it until you mentioned it. Yeah, no, they, he's been murdered. At least they brought back kind of their original logo. That intermediary logo was horrible, in horrible. Well, maybe they're still open. Whoa, what's going on in here? Are they, are they open? No, they, they must be closed. Bogo. Bogo, buy one, get one, half off. Oh, there's different bogos for everybody. What are they doing in there? It's closed, but they're... I guess they're organizing themselves. Now, what's that character? That's a new one? Oh, wow. What is this? Cthulhu? <laughs> oh, uh, the witch. Yeah. But with three noses? That doesn't make any sense. That's, I guess that replaced Fudgy the Whale, and they got a pumpkin. Is that Witchy Puss? Witchy Poo. <laughs> witchy Puss. Huh. It's all, all, all so confusing. This is sort of like our theme last time, too. Pumpkin everything. Pumpkin shake. Pumpkin Ugh, Sunday. pumpkin shakes. All right. We got a lot of ice cream shops in Nutley. I know. We have no, no, no shortage of ice cream. Only one vape shop so far. I know. We have downtown auto service. Grand open. And look at that Visa logo. That's that. That is two or three logos ago. That's wow. really old. old it's very old school. That's a Mastercard, isn't that old too? Uh, well, they just rebranded again. That's old too. Yeah. They don't accept Diners Club. What the hell? What, what do they got underneath it? Oh, American Express. Yeah, but right, like if you have Diners Club, you're out of luck. I mean, I'm a treasurer for my union, and we have American Express, and that's it? a lot of places we can't even use it. So. There's still a lot that don't accept that. It's ridiculous. All right, we got to take a selfie at some point here. Oh, this is a little cookie mark, too. Yeah. Some uh, tobacco or something. You want to get your cigarettes, Frank? Uh, yeah. <laughs> your mentos? Yeah. I, I just have cigarillos. So this might be a good place to do a selfie, I think, in this light, so we can just sort of stand here with this in the background. Get the Nutley newsstand in the back. Yeah. 
Let's just try it here. So we have something for the show. Art. Ooh, Ruben. What does Ruben say? Did he, did he tweet? <laughs> was going to ask Frank if he was free for lunch or dinner this weekend. How long are you here for? What? Manny. Rule. Free for lunch this weekend. Oh. I wanted to know if you were free for lunch this weekend. <laughs> oh, okay. You said you have family stuff going on, right? Let's see. We're, we're all on our phones now here. Uh, let's see. All right. Oh, it's good lighting here. Okay. Oh, I, I like this lighting. This is yeah, this is kind of a good background, right? Uh... Let me, fix my, guy take let me fix my hair here. All right. Ready? Yes. Here we go. Let's take a few. Why does this not look right? Let's change the angle a little bit. Let's just go this way. Yeah, I like that. I like this background. It's yeah. Like, it almost looks like we're not... It looks like a fake background. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look real. Yeah, it looks like we're standing in front of We're, we're like on a green screen here. Maybe this isn't real. Well, we know at some level this is some sort of... We don't know what this is. This is like a little Hollywood backdrop. Exactly. All right, we got our selfie. See, I have to talk to Ruben. We see if we can... Uh, but it's the weekend now, so it's tough to get together. Yeah. I don't know. This place... This place which shall remain nameless, so they use a good font. Pretty big. Let's see. It's still open. There's people in there. Let's 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 peer inside. Well, you could eat fourteen ninety nine. Really? Well, considering the quality of their food, that's a pretty. Yeah. Not that many people in there. I better be quiet. I'm, we're we're here. I I don't want to insult them. Not many people in there, and they don't look. No. Too I I don't know. There's 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 even anyone ever goes in there. It's like a. The vase still going. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, this is uh, this is the place. Yeah, I ordered food from there. It took them like two hours to deliver it, and there were none of those dipping sauces, and everything tasted like sulfur. It was horrible. Well, let me change the price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. All you can eat. Very sad. Group Groupon customers must need reservation, and if you have any coupons, please present them before placing order. There's a lot of rules at this place. You know, you can't just go in and eat Indian food. You have to follow all these rules. There's another rule in front of us. That's right. Rule from the Netherlands. Here's a massage parlor. Taekwondo. So this is my town. It's like Taekwondo. And aren't they? They're using the Radio Shack font. Look at that. It's like, isn't that illegal? Three, what is it? Uh, three classes for $19. Really? Taekwondo. And then you'll look like this once you're done. Yeah. Ooh, sound. Here we go. Oh, where it's going. There we go. All right, there's the garbage can. Where is he going? I don't know. It's uh, taking out the garbage. Taekwondo. But I'm saying, like, they're using the Radio Shack font. Like, Radio Shack's still in business. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's like, illegal. Radio Shack should sue. But let me, let's look inside here. What does it look like in here? Oh, it's like it is. It is like a a karate place. Yeah, they call dojo. It a dojo. A dojo, like a, a large empty space where you can do karate on each other. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Who knew? There's so much fun stuff in Nutley. There's another learning, another learning center. center. Wow. We had issues back up for We had come <laughs> on before. Now we have sold. <laughs> the, the, and look at that newsstand. Holy crap! What is going on there? It's a messy newsstand. Oh my god! I've never seen anything like it. I think those are the learning books. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Is that hidden? Yeah, that's hidden behind the... Wow, it's like this, this newsstand of old, like, ratty books. It's a little bit I haven't used the word ratty so much in it. Much. It's really sloppy in there. Yeah. Well, I mean, but maybe they do some good uh, some good learning in there, but you don't know. When my son Michael was, like, in... <laughs> Every door you school. can't go in is, is used next door. What first year of high school, we brought my son to one of them to look at getting tutoring. It's yeah. very expensive. Really? It's like thousands of dollars. It's like a booming business. Franklin Steakhouse. Blowout. I think that... Blowout yeah, I think the, the Steakhouse is, is relatively new. What is this? Blowout the Run? 
Another notice. Ooh. Another thing I notice in not like a lot of fish tanks. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of fish tanks. Yeah. There must be who 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 does the fish tanks in this town? It's they're not li- they're not little either. No. Monstrous fish tanks. Yeah, there's giant fish tanks everywhere. Gone with the, Gone wings. With the wings. They're they're still uh, maybe they're still. Oh, I like their I like their menu. <laughs> all all handwritten. BLT Taylor ham and cheese grilled cheese. We got it all here. Gone with the wings. Anything vegetarian? Yeah, oh, nice. I come here for I could come here for breakfast. That would be so strange. I I just come here for breakfast one day. <laughs> then I'll take D camp in, into work. Now this is the place I'm interested in. Thank you for the. Did they move? <laughs> Philly Pretzel Factory Team, Township of Nutley, friends and family, especially M- McCulloch and Sons Construction, and their families for making our dream come true. Now I really want. I want to go here. I really want to get some Philly Pretzel Factory. I have. There's one in Edison by where I'm working lately, and I got them the other day. They're pretty good. So what, what, they're only open till what? Uh, the eight o'clock eight. during during the week. Okay, that's not. That's not bad. Because they, they like at a party. Was this the place you got like a tray? Huh? You can go on a Saturday. Yeah, that's true. But they give you like a tray of a, like little pretzel bites and dipping yeah. sauces and stuff. Yeah, that's pretty good. They also, I know you wouldn't have it, but they also had a, a pretzel with a Philly cheesesteak inside it. Really? That sounds that sounds very non-vegetarian to me. Another Nutley convenience. Now look at this. They sold they sold uh, instant lottery tickets. Six thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars. Look at this. They, they they can advertise all the winners they had. There's another one, seventeen. Seventeen thousand eight hundred and twenty-three dollars. Wow. How do all these convenience stores stay open? Some some bikers, great. Aren't, aren't people sleeping? What is this? Oh, let's look at the community bulletin board. Another breezeway. And this is another one of those parking lots where you have to go put put your, your you type your parking space into a machine, and pay your pay pay your fee. Township information. Maybe they'll say what was going on by the high school tonight. Yeah. Townwide vegetative waste pickup. Trash removal service. This is actually good information. I need this for my recycling and stuff. Electronics recycling. Oh yeah. You mean I'm not just supposed to throw it in the garbage? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, of course, I properly recycle all my electronics. The town-wide garage sale, September 24th and 25th. Wow. That, oh, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. It's already October. How about... Uh, I mean, a green day is <laughs> going to be at the marketplace. Green day? Wow. No, it's green day. Oh. September. What, 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 don't they ever August. update this? All, all this stuff is from September. August. So depressing. I can't go to up, upcoming events. September 2016, great. This, yeah, October this 2nd. Like what is it? Remi- Reminder? It's an app you can get for your Apple. Or your Google. I mean, what does it do? It tells Probably you about the remind you events. of... Oh, of the recycling and stuff. Offense. Okay, well, that's good. Sure. I love that sound. Listen to that sound. What is that little store back there? Um, it's like a sports store or something. Oh, this is the Nutley Diner. See another diner we could go to. But yeah, this is like a sports store. But look, look again how like messy everything is. Look, look at this. Look at this rollerblade box. It's like smashed and old. And it's for rental only. It's a hundred and thirty-five dollars. Oh yeah, that's actually a super. Let's see if that's open. It's, I've been meaning to go to that supermarket. There's a new supermarket in town. This is this is a parking lot I have parked in quite a bit, like uh, going to the laundromat and stuff. This is yeah, Monero Sports Shop. Oh, there's the back of that steakhouse. Yeah, the steakhouse. I, I was in there once when it was a different uh, business. I went there for someone's graduation or something. It has multiple levels here. Yeah, I was on like the third level, but I forget what the event was. Natural Gourmet. This looks very promising. I want to see what this is all about. It's like a Whole food. Yeah. It has a date on it. What is? What do they put a new sign up every day for the date? That is today, October fourteenth, yeah, Friday. On. What? Oh, they open today. <laughs> oh, today was their opening day. This is opening day. Are you serious? Yeah. No. Opening October fourteenth. Th- today's opening yeah. day. I, I thought close. it was already. It's close. No. 
sushi center. Look opening October today. That's today. Yes. Holy crap. I thought it was open for months. I I kept seeing it, but maybe it was never opened. It looks pretty nice. Oh wow, look at this. This is like a real And look they have the old school like fruits and vegetable writing on the wall. They got pumpkin. Look at this. What's going on pumpkin. here? Gourds. This almost looks like a mini delicious orchard. Yeah. This is cool. All right, I'm going to come here. I could come here tomorrow. When do they open? Uh, <laughs> they don't even have the hours on the door. They want a cashier. Oh, nice. They can get a second job. Yeah, exactly. Love this place looks really... It's, it's a, it, just to describe it to you, it's a, it's a nice... It's like a new supermarket in my town. But it's like a, it's smaller than a, than, a, than a regular supermarket. But it feels kind of... It could be like... Look, they have, they have like fancy croutons over there. What the hell? That, 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 that's the sign of a great store, the croutons. Lots of lots of jams and jellies over there. We only we only have a limited perspective. We can't see the whole store here. They have a sushi section. 50 percent off. Look, fifty percent off sushi. Lots of fruit and vegetables. P papaya. This is really cool. The apples look nice. And look, they have those uh, glass domes on the ceiling for security cameras. Do they really need like twenty security cameras in this place? I guess shoplifting is a big problem. They have all the Asian vegetables. Oh yeah, like bok, bok choy. Yeah. And what, what is this here? They have uh, blackberries, 99 cents. Wow. This actually does look like a pretty good place. They even have a meat market in the back. I know that's great. Really that, that's, great. Yeah, that's really not. Meat um, and fish. And a yeah. deli. So I'll, I'll be coming here. I could come here tomorrow if I wanted to. But I probably won't. I'll probably just be lazy and not, not do anything. <laughs> but I, I should come over here. But I think, see, this, the thing is this parking lot, you got to pay in that stupid machine to park here. And so that takes away all of the uh, excitement of shopping here, right? Meters are something. <laughs> Must be broken. Yeah, the meter's broken. Great. That's just amazing when we walked in here when the sign is up there. I, can't, <laughs> I, I, I thought that they, they put up a new sign every day. That's like, today is October 14th. <laughs> wow. Brand new supermarket. But I'm telling you... I haven't seen it from this perspective. But on the other street, I've been seeing this for six months. I, I can't. Maybe it reopened. Maybe it reopened because it's been here for a long time. Do you remember time. what it was before? Was no, it? I don't remember. I could have sworn it was already open. So it looks like it was some kind of grocery. It must have been a. This must be a grand reopening or something. They must have had some sort of disaster there or something. <laughs> and once again, it's the Nutley and Nitro. Glass. Yes, they have a lot of pride in Nutley. These meters are enforced 24 hours a day. But yeah, the Nutley Diner is definitely a, a very classic diner. They remodeled it as well, but it's a, it's a real old school diner. It's been here for a long time. You know, Ruben and Clara had never been to a diner. Have you ever been to a diner? No. See? Oh, we could have went there. Well, you know, we, we could go to the Nutley Diner and we're all full now from all of our meals, but uh, I don't know. We could have got our dessert there. Yeah. The Nutley Diner. Now, what's that street coming in there? Is that like a main drag, too? Or? Uh, yeah, that is... Um, I should know the name of Center Street, I think. Okay, yeah. so that's why I was going to yeah. wonder why. Yeah, yeah. So you can get to all these stores from Center Street, too. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what we have over here. Another medical group. I'm getting to know my town so much better. The, what is this place? The the the, the the Bosphorus. It almost sounds like phosphorus, but it's Bosphorus. Hmm. Hmm. Sounds very dreamlike. It's open. It's open but empty. Uh, Turkish, Turkish food. Oh, Turkish, Turkish food. food. Interesting. Yeah, I've been to Nutley Diner many, many times. They used to have really good nachos there, but then they weren't as good anymore. That's all I eat when I go to diners is nachos. nachos? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is a classic one. Open 24 hours, you know. All the kids hanging out in there. Yeah, All the teenagers, kids. yeah. High school kids. Yeah. Oh, wow, look at that shirt. That Back of that shirt, that's um, from Naruto. It's uh, Sasuke, yeah. What's the name of his, his tribe of uh, ninjas? Uh, Uchiha. 
It could be somebody in there. Like Uchiha the tribe. The, the Uchiha ninjas. Yeah. It looks almost like a, uh, a Pokemon, but it's not. Some of you out there know what I'm talking about. Now, that used to be Rita's right there, but now it's Gencarelli Brothers. <laughs> what is that? Is I don't know. Pizza. Pizza, okay. Yard sale tomorrow, 22 Hunt Street. Now, here's a place I used to take my comforters to this. Uh, uh, the cleaners? Yeah, because uh, we couldn't fit the comforter in our uh, washing machine. Though we have a new washing machine now that I think is big enough. Sake sushi? Oh, yeah, at this health food store, I bought, I bought one of those ear candles once. You know that fake thing, you, you stick a candle in your ear? Yes, yes. So I tried burning it without putting it in my ear, and, and little orange stuff that looked like earwax formed. Off the, so it's uh, fake. The guy even told me, I went here, and the guy told me, you know, these ear candles, I can't guarantee the, the, the reality of it. And I'm like, no, no, I want an ear candle. I think you documented that in an episode. I, I think so. Didn't you? I, I did, yeah. Yes, I remember that. An another alley. <laughs> Layla's Custom Tailoring. Huh. And this is Vis Vesa dresses. Interesting. Banana cellular, another banana reference. Almost took a trip. Yeah, but that's banana cellular. That's interesting. It's actually getting kind of kind of chilly out here, huh? It's kind of nice. It's a nice uh, nip in the air. Body delights, sports nutrition. Farmer for rent. What is it? Ooh. 15, 11 fifty. That's pretty. That's pretty good. That's uh, it one bedroom. Heat and hot water. That's actually. Please call Anthony. Eleven fifty for one bedroom. I think that's actually pretty good for around here. Especially with the heat and water. Included, yeah. Because the heat could be a couple hundred bucks a month. Yeah. Uh, 208, only one away from 209. You know, where is 209? As usual, there's like no 209. The 206. It oh, it's across the street. It would be banana. Is banana? Banana is 209? Maybe. Or I w well, Horizon. That whole building might be 205. Yeah, that's true. Well, you can dream. Someday. Nope, 199, so it's. Oh, so it is Verizon. Great. So here is a place that is. What is this? Oh, this is pon I, I order from here quite a bit. Poncho's Burritos. I actually, we order, this is our main place we order from. <laughs> really good burrito place. Poncho's Burritos. Honestly, it's very good. It's California style Mexican. And th look at the sign here. This is uh, the sign on the uh, Heller Heller. Really beautiful old school sign. Uh, and police officers may be posing as store employees. <laughs> You know, they may be. Uh, I'm surprised they don't have that lit up the sign. That's a sign. That I know. It's uh, it's it looks like it's from the 1950s. I mean, it's really old school. Beautiful sign. Strange store, but this tells us it's after 10 because liquor stores stay open till 10. Yeah. It is 10:37. Hmm. Normal sprint. It's a Nutley sprint. The Nutley know, sprint. Nutley here. Very. Very proud of their town. Yes. I wish I felt more involved. Uh, and it's the, the Nutley empty <laughs> empty oh, yeah. storefront. Hey, how about we have an overnightscape store? Yes. You know, I could sell copies of the Ansa Guide the book. Now, what is this? This is a uh, oh look, you can get a Pokemon pizza. Bel Paese. See the Pokemon pizza? Yes. Pikachu. Bellevue Police Department cocktail dinner. The police cocktail dinner, nice. Well, the pizza. Twelve inch pie, five dollars. That's pretty good. Really? Twelve inch pie. That's like a little one, though. That looks like that. That looks like something from the movie Alien. That's very. Yeah. <laughs> and it's in like a, it's in that roll like that instead of a. Interesting. Now, what the heck is this? Oh, it's like a uh, parking, parking lot. lot. Yeah. Another empty store. Empty stores. I'm telling you, we can have, we can have the overnight escape world. Just go in there and uh, you go, into, go into a little listening booth and you can listen to the overnight escape. 
this would be it. Yeah. If you could open up an art store, because he does a lot of... Yeah. Disability parking right in the back. Look, there's people over there. Yes. Is there an opening here? It's not on this side. Can they get out? I don't know. The other side had a gate. Yeah. Whoa, that's interesting. There's people going in there. Oh, that's their apartment. They live there. Wow. Uh, Wedding what dresses? dresses? Brides dresses. That's the Vessa. That was the same one down the road, wasn't it? Yeah, it's like a chain. <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. Some elaborate dresses. <laughs> yeah. The medical plaza. This is actually very cool to see the town from this perspective. Who knew you could have so much fun so close to home? <laughs> they don't like giving free parking. In the Look at 24 room. hour parking meters. Jeez. So at th even at 3 a.m., they have meter maids. Lovely Rita is uh, checking out all the meters in, in the middle of the night. This is an auditorium? <laughs> what? <laughs> Isn't it like you can just have a freestanding auditorium? St. <laughs> Ludovico of Casoria Auditorium. I, it's just like you, you normally think that like an auditorium is part of a school or part of a business. It's not, its own, not, just, not, not just like a freestanding. Is this the church or is this St. Ludovico? Maybe. I mean, I must have driven past here hundreds of times. I don't even recognize these buildings. Says, what? The children are in the playground. The children are in the playground. That is very scary. There is a there is a, a sign obviously that they, that could, that can be you know moved in and out. The children are in the playground. That sounds like some sort of code word. I know. Like begin the attack. The children are in the playground. The children are in the playground. Mama Vittoria, casual Italian restaurant and catering. People having having a heated discussion. Yes. <laughs> Every, everyone everyone has such issues. Big, big party. Oh yeah, there's a there's a party one, going one, on. Yeah. One, one. Oh nice, yeah. They're having like some sort of celebration. Look at them. Stella Artois. Really, some Stella Artois. Sorry if I uh, okay. give you a flat Manny. <laughs> flat Manny. Oh my there we god. Go. <laughs> Flat I, I said that without even realizing it. You know, like like when you when you step on someone else's shoe and their shoe comes off, they call it a flat. Him, I should have run him for the. Yeah, where's Flat Manny? Here. Come on. And here's the new king chef, Chinese food. It's open. And they and they have a state you can enjoy a snapple in there. This is a gigantic nail salon. <laughs> Did you hear they? I think they passed a law in this town that you couldn't open a nail salon like 300 yeah, yards from another nail salon. There's just too many in this town. <laughs> They, it's like a, they must do so much, make so much money at these places. This is this reminds me of Better Call Saul. Yeah. They have any uh, coconut, uh, yeah. cucumber water cucumber in there? Water yeah. Somewhere. There's Better, Call, there's Saul's office back there. This does actually look a lot like that, the one in the show. There's a new place that I saw a report on the news the other night. This guy is opening up nail salons for men. Really? Because they say like men feel. Funny Le walking into left a, out of the whole nail salon well, they thing. They said they would feel funny going into a like a nail salon dedicated to women more. Yeah. So he's he's opening up these around the country, and they have uh, they'll serve you a beer while you're getting your nails done. They have uh, shaves and massages and stuff. Go to East Coast Film. School. Oh wow! I could have gone to film school here, <laughs> the East Coast Film School, right? Here. Wow! I didn't realize I'd have film school in town. So really, it's, but but more like to do like a like a. To cut your nails, not to put the... the, the no, not to paint it, but oh, to get okay. a manicure or, okay, yeah. or a pedicure. But they also, like I said, they'll serve you beers while you're... That's a good idea. Because they said a lot of guys would get it done, but they don't want to... They feel like... They feel uncomfortable, yeah. Yeah, walking into a room with a lot of women. Yeah. Flavia Soaps. <laughs> Look at this. You know, you wonder how some of these businesses stay in business. Yeah. I, how, you have a dedicated store for soap. Normally, <laughs> you, you buy it at the A&P. You know, but here you're going to buy a soap store. Wow. See, this looks like something that would be in uh, one of those street fairs. Like yeah. Like a little stand. It must be pretty good soap, Flavia. Yeah. More expensive. Yeah. And they have some Buddha Buddhas in there. They have invitations. D dress forms. Paper goods, jewelry. Wow. So it's more than soap. Yeah. Soap and more. Flavia. And here's the A&S Fine Foods. Yes. I've, Sausage I've with a, a pig logo. You've been here. I've been here. You bought probably some meat products here. Meat products and cheeses and uh, Italian. Like Raised without antibiotics. Uh oh, what do we got here? 
12th annual dinner dance for to honor St. Padre Pio. That's Sunday. Ah, oh, we can go. 75 a person. Yeah. This we, is this weekend too, friend. We will reopen on Sundays. Saint the 117th annual Feast of St. Gerard Maiella. It's going on right now. October 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th. Could that be what was going on? Where oh, it going could on? be. Oh, okay. A lot, of, a lot of festivals going on. A lot of festivals indeed. Uh oh. Oh, there's Michael's. That's where we had a lovely dinner. Another alleyway. What? What's going on here? Eyebrow threading. And nail salon. A and S. Well, there still is. There, there's a convenience store called A and S right in uh, Lynnhurst. Well, wasn't there like a like A and S was like in? The oh yeah, Abraham and Strauss, yeah, Abraham of course. And Strauss. We have Ray Ban here. Susan Valenza, optician. Interesting. <clears throat> well, I think we have a uh, real. Uh, State Farm. Nice. We well, definitely really are discovering a lot. Cost to get an education at these schools? Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Princeton, two hundred forty-seven thousand. Yeah. What, what? What is that? The price there? That, oh, that, that's really how much it costs to go there, huh? So Notre Dame is more than Princeton. Wow. It's hard to get an education these days. And NYU is more than any of them. How much is that? Jeez, I went to NYU too. <laughs> Yikes. NYU's more than Princeton and Notre Dame. They say a lot of times you're better off just getting learning a trade and just going to work. I think so. You'll be ahead of the game. It would take you like 20 years to pay off these there's loans. So, there's so many kids that went through those schools and have like a, a debt bigger than a mortgage. Yeah. Right and no real skills either. Just look at me. <laughs> I, no, my skills are not from college. They're just like I just developed my computer skills after college. I could have done it without that. So the jobs you got, they didn't require college. Then I, or... then I wouldn't have been on the radio with anything but Monday show with Frank and Mike. <laughs> See, I, I needed to go to college to do that show. Another parking deck <laughs> with, with, uh, with a strange to... steam coming out of the top. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> That's odd. There's like a there's like a there's like a smoke effect over there. Maybe, maybe it's on fire. Maybe the building's on fire. Now, is there some kind of electronics here to let people in this? Or? Yeah, probably. This sort of reminds me of when we got into that parking lot yeah. in uh, New Brunswick when we went in the in wrong way. Oh yeah, yeah. We oh, I remember that. Yeah. We had our phone car. Yeah, we had to have the manager let us out. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Wow. Well. Good tour. Yeah, this is, uh, and then Vidiello's Bakery, very famous bakery. That place has been there forever. They honestly have really good bread there and good cakes. So whenever we go, we're going over to someone's house, we need to bring something. A lot of times we'll stop at Vidiello's. They got good stuff. Got here? Hero King. Nice to have a good sub chef. Yeah. Here we got a roast beef with fresh, fresh mutts. Great. Mutts. <laughs> M-U-T-Z. Shop here, park here. I guess they the muscle the wrap, the godfather, the cranberry chicken wrap, the tree hugger. Wow. <laughs> oh, look, they have uh, celebrities that have been here. Director Johnny Salami. Wow. Any of those people moved? Look, Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers was here. Was she really? Looks like it. Hero King, can we talk? Wow. I know Joan Rivers was here. What is this odd little rubber pig? What's the significance of that with uh, Mardi Gras beads on it? That must have some meaning. Oh, no. It seems rather sinister. It's the pig from, uh, what's the butcher called in Salvatore's? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have the happy birthday Frank. Wow. Come celebrate Frank Sinatra's birthday with our famous Hoboken sandwich. Nice. Crushed in for morning. <laughs> wow. And the uh, the 
the foil, like you know those those foil balloons oh. of footballs are deflating. Well, that's for football Talk about Sunday. Deflate Gate. Look at this. Yes, football Sunday. <laughs> wow. So much to see. Frank de Giacomo, dentistry. A very evil looking tooth ca cartoon character. <laughs> that is wild. I've never seen quite a tooth character like that. So. Well, I think actually the CVS is around the corner. The CVS is down there. But. Yeah. Well, there's a sea, there's like a little river over there, and someone drove their car into it just very recently. I think like a month ago, someone drove their car into There's like a little river over there? Yeah. What is this? Is it open? Oh, Il Trapezio. Dessert place. Yeah. Il Trapezio. And there in the distance is the CVS. We don't need to go there, though. Yeah. So I think we're. Uh, I think we're at the border. Yeah. <laughs> we go down much further, we'll be at path. No, path marks back up that way. I wish there was a path mark. Path mark well, is dead. Is shop right, I mean. I'm shop sure. right, yeah. You're getting my hopes up that they, that they brought back path mark. They made it. The path mark in Elizabeth opened up as something else. I can't think of the name of it now. It's a store I never heard of before. It's very sad. Path so mark. They're, they're little by little, like re. Opening them as different things, which makes me think: if another supermarket could open, why did they close? I know. And who's that guy that did the commercials? Oh, you, you know who I'm talking about. Yes, he's been. He's an actor. He's he, he was in one of those um, Living Dead movies. Uh, yeah, I I listen to Gilbert Gottfried's podcast, and he talks about him all the time. Really, James something. James. Yeah, I, I, I know I talked about it on the show at some point, but. Yeah, he was the spokesman. Yeah, he always thought he was like Mr. Pathmark. Yeah. What's that for? Flags. Yeah, oh, flags. flags. It's a five-flag uh, 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 um, apparatus. I wonder if there's a Nutley flag. I don't know. <laughs> the flag of Nutley. Wow, look at all those. Look at all those electrical meters. Wow, that's a lot. Wow. <laughs> it's like. I've never seen so many electrical meters. It's wild. I guess it's easy for the meter reader. <laughs> oh, the guy's name was James Karen. James Karen. Yeah. yeah. It rings a bell because he, yeah, he was in a few movies. Jim Karen, James Karen. Bring to a room for Mickey. Ooh. <laughs> what? There's, a little, there's little miniature doors to a miniature room called the sprinkler room. So, basically, the, all of the fire sprinklers are in that little room. Wouldn't it be better if they were, like, in people's houses? And here's the sprinkler pumps are at 125 and it, what, Oh, this could be a business as well. Yeah. Yeah, I went to look up James Karen, and before I did it, it came to my head. James Karen. Really? Yeah, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, I'm sure you've had a local... Well, Pathmark was more nationwide, wasn't it? Yeah. I thought it was. He's on YouTube. You could find the commercials on YouTube. Yeah, he, he uh, it was just this guy. And he's just like, come this week to Pathmark and uh, Chuck Rose Steak, half off, or whatever the heck it was. Because yeah. back in the day, you had to sit and watch the commercials. You couldn't fast forward through them because you had to DVR. So you had to watch all the supermarket commercials. Now, Rule, do you is there a main supermarket chain in the Netherlands? Like? Albert Heijn. Albert Heijn. Why do I uh, recognize that name? Did you give me some stuff from there? Probably, okay, probably yeah. I brought you some Albert Heijn stuff. Albert Heijn. Nice. Now, how about some? I think uh, he also owns some supermarkets here in the U.S. But yeah, it rings a bell. I think Stop and Shop is owned by now. Really? I, that's my main supermarket, Stop and Shop. Oh. So what? Now, what about? Are there any American chains that are big in? In your place, so. Starbucks, Target. Starbucks is starting to come. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, recently, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, TK? No. TJ Maxx. TJ Maxx. Really? Open, open <laughs> that seems. That seems called TK Maxx. Really? That seems like an awfully strange store to be expanding uh, worldwide. Right, get ready for it. Yeah. We're gonna do the commercial. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Open. 
Yes. Look for this circular in Sunday's paper for super coupon bonanza savings like That's these. In. A half gallon of Tropicana orange juice, $1.39. A dozen Pathmark large eggs, 69 cents. And a half gallon of Pathmark premium ice cream, $1.39. Come to Pathmark super coupon bonanza where you're the one who's number one 24 hours a day. Pathmark. And the Pathmark had that red, white, and blue logo like no yeah. other supermarket. 1985. See, I could put that on the other side. James <laughs> Karen. <laughs> but that guy was, did it for decades, right? Yeah. He, he was always there. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't the light on here when we were here before? Yeah. Yes, the Am I is. like, whoa, there's people there. Oh, they're still in the back. Oh, they may have heard us talking about them. Wait a second. There's, there's like a weird frosted glass, and we see people back there. They're making soap. <laughs> they are. They have little elves making soap in the back. <laughs> No, wait, where are we? Oh, we're over here. We're okay. down this street. Okay. Yeah. Well, I hope they didn't hear us criticizing their <laughs> their concept. But now we thinking they're con- oh, people yeah. don't like us. <laughs> That's the type of store I've walked through with my wife many soap stores that we've never bought soap. I know you. See, they're always around those soap stores, and ooh, here it is back there here. They are. <laughs> we don't want to be like. A, off your soapbox. Yeah. I'm glad we played the Pathmark commercial. Oh, that's <laughs> great. I have to, I'm going to have to watch some more of those. We know that that movie I made when I, in 1987, The Evil Farm, a whole, a, whole, a whole lot of it was done in a Pathmark. Oh, really? So I have the one in uh, Somerville. And of course, you know. Maybe you can add some uh, Dutch commercials to the other side. Yeah. Pe- people won't be knowing what they're listening to. Well, I have, I do have a whole Dutch thing on the other side. I forget what it was, though, but there's there's one Dutch segment. Um, I, didn't, I didn't hear it. It's for uh, Dutch chocolate or something. Uh, and I have a Portuguese one, too, from actually from Portugal. But that one is that one's because it was the only popcorn-flavored yogurt drink I could find in the world. <laughs> So, uh, it was, uh, they had cap- cappuccino and popcorn flavored yogurt drink. Now, did, he, did they have any kind of, uh, famous, like, sponsor man or woman that does a lot of commercials for a, a business that's almost, like, more famous than the business because, like, uh, yeah, they had a couple, but, um... I think um, not not for not that I know for a whole lot of years, uh, but they they definitely had some people like, like we uh, have Crazy Eddie guy. He was a big guy. We have Jerry Carroll. Now we have Flo for Progressive. Or oh my God! There's yeah. certain ones that you they're just on, and you just like you don't even know why they're on. It's just, you had a, an actor who played a for Albert Heijn, actually. Really, Albert. Heijn. You had you had an actor who played a, a supermarket manager, and he did that for a couple of years, and you never saw him anywhere else. They they he was really, they kept him off the grid. His name wasn't Mr. Whipple, was it? No, 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 okay. no. no. Well, we had the, <laughs> that was another supermarket manager. Yeah. We had the Dunkin' Donuts man. He used to oh, make yeah. the donuts. Who looked a lot like Mr. Whipple, yeah. right? We had the Maytag repair man. They still have him, though, right? Is he still around? Yeah. I don't know if Maytag like is, remains as relevant a brand to everyone, but uh, you know, it seems like all all of the uh, washing machines now are like Samsung or, or LG. You know, I don't know about May. I'm sure some people get Maytag. Now we're driving back through where we just walked. Yeah, we we opted with the LG brand, Lucky Gold Star. It's a good washing machine. You're right, Frank. There wouldn't have been much more to see. Yeah, you know, it's this sort of Does the. Does it have its own internet connection already, or your washing machine? Uh, no, no. Yeah. We're not yeah. at the the Internet of Things <laughs> is is coming in 2018, I think. They have the refrigerator with the the camera inside, right? Yeah, and it has you could like sort of program what you get, and it'll tell you when you're running low or something. Yeah. There used to be a postal uniform store over here. Is it gone? Uh, I do remember a uniform store. I think it is gone though. Oh, okay, I remember. I always pass it by and always say I should stop in. But. Yeah. Farmers markets on Sundays. So, are they still doing that thing down there? I nope. think it's probably. No, it's over. It's over. They had. There were lights on the street and there were fire trucks on display. Here's my local post office right here. 
I've waited online in there many times. They're pretty, they're pretty nice in there, though. Uh, the guys who deliver mail from there work out of uh, Belleville. Oh, really? Yeah, over on Main Street by Route 21. They don't actually work out of there anymore. Yeah, one time they tried to deliver a letter to us that was we had to sign for. And then, like, we never got it, and the, the, the letter carrier gave me, like, his personal phone number, and oh, I, we were really? calling him, and, like, it was this never-ending process, and in the end, we never even knew what it was. We never got it. Like, oh. like we would go there, like, do you have this letter? Like, yeah. like <laughs> is it behind the counter? They're like, no. It's, and they kept leaving us notes, and it, it was very mysterious. Like, nothing ever happened, though. Yeah, after 15 days, it gets sent back. It's probably like I won a million dollars, and then they, yeah. I, I had to sign for it, and I, I, I never got it. Frank, this is your long lost uncle. I'm leaving. Yeah, you. exactly. Please respond. <laughs> so, so own. now, so the street we're on is actually the street I live on. It's just that this, um, like a mile down or something. So here we are, back to the uh, overnight scape uh, studio. Here it is. So, I'll do a spin around. We gotta go back that way. Yeah. That's an interesting address for the house on the telephone pole. Yeah. Is that what the numbers are here? Six hundred? Uh yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, this was good. I'm everyone for we, for joining us on our mini adventure. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, adventures back. Thank you, Rule and Manny. Say hi, you. Yeah. And do, you, do now, Rule? Can you uh, do the honors to take us to the other side? And now we're going to the other side. And yes, we will have some other sides as time goes by. Maybe the next overnight scape we include. But um, I, 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 got, I got plans. And uh, we will indeed have uh, other side stuff. Because that is a magnificent uh, counterbalance to an overnight scape show. And that, I must admit, was an exceptional choice that I lucked into on that. Manny the Mailman and Rule and Frank. Up to, and it's amazing just having other people in one's hometown and walking around with them. You find and discover all sorts of things that even though you're there, even in a small town like Truth or Consequences, you'd never notice because it's like we enter into a different mode when we're showing people we like places and just it, it it's a disarming thing walking around i mean that that yogurt place it, i wonder if it's still there i mean this is all um pre covid and i think the uh, yogurt place thing has kind of maybe run a course but boy that sounded great and i wish i'd have been there um that that night walk discourse and hearing rules uh, opinions from overseas about what was going on then um, it, it was all very intriguing to hear and to, to all that political and election stuff which was approached in a very diplomatic and non well I guess other things happened subsequent to the election but we already know that and that doesn't matter because that was a great, great show. And uh, they, they even mentioned Gilbert Gottfried. Um, and I have to say, I'm going to be talking about Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast, um, probably on the next Appreciator or the one after that, because, I mean, we lost Gilbert a couple of years ago now, and I still really haven't adjusted to... The loss of him. I mean, not only was he an A1 unique and fearless comedian, but his knowledge of the same sort of pop culture and trivia that drives me was just so wonderful. And the guests he would have on the amazing Colossal podcast, it, it, it was just a fabulous program. And I'm glad it persists because, you know, sometimes people pass on, but I just checked. And if you search Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast, you too can hear episodes and enjoy his legacy because uh, it's, it's an important thing. We all uh, need to have our legacy 
enjoyed. Um, right now, what I have for you here uh, and coming is uh, a program very reminiscent of Vic and Sade. In fact, I really think uh, Peg Lynch, the writer and co-performer, was trying to be Paul Reimer with this. Um, it's called Ethel and Albert, and actually no episodes were thought to survive until very recently. So um, you're in for a sort of a treat here. Check this out. The Private Lives of Ethel and Albert, starring Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce. Life's brighter moments are usually the small incidental things that happen in the routine of everyday life. It's these small things, so familiar to everyone, that make up the private lives of Ethel and Albert. We'll hear from Ethel and Albert in a minute. Every minute of the day, somewhere in the country, a traffic accident is happening. One a minute. That's almost 1,500 in a day. 1,500 people either hurt or killed. And the accident rate isn't going down, it's going up. In the four months following the end of gas rationing, traffic death jumped 37%. Why? Many reasons. Fast speeds, careless driving, driving when drunk, unsafe cars. Driving, at best, is a cautious business. When you slide behind the wheel of a car, you hold a potentially dangerous instrument in your hands. Although driving may seem like the easiest and safest thing in the world, it takes just a moment of carelessness to send your car smashing into something. Some years ago, an article appeared in a national magazine. It was called, And Sudden Death. It described in vivid passages how accidents occur, the pain involved, the tragic consequences. When you finished reading the article, you felt shocked, horrified. The article wasn't a pleasant one, but accidents themselves aren't pleasant either. It would be well if we would remember this not-so-pretty side of driving from time to time. It would help decrease our startling accident rate. Safety is entirely up to you. You can never afford to take a chance with injury or death. Remember the ABCs of safety and always be careful. Now, Ethel and Albert. It's early evening in the Arbuckle home. Ethel is looking over the evening paper, and Albert is looking at the small spray chair on the corner by the radio. Now, what the heck's the matter with this chair? No, the rung is loose. Haven't we got any iron glue? Mm, somewhere. We had some. Ought to be in that kitchen drawer, shouldn't it? But you have such a mess in that kitchen drawer, I don't know what's there. Well, I might as well get at it. I think I'll go look for some glue, see if I can't fix that thing. Uh, I'll get it, I'll get it. I'm on my way past anyhow. Hello. Yeah? Who? Oh, hi, Kitty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a second. Ethel. Mm -hmm. Kitty Rowling? Yeah, yeah, uh, she wants to talk to you. Uh, look, honey, if the glue isn't in the kitchen, where do you think it would be? Oh, you may have taken it to the basement. You just have to look around, dear, or else look in the box in the back entry. You've got a lot of stuff in that, too. He Hello, Kitty. Oh, yeah, well, how's the bride to be? <laughs> you quit working now, haven't you? Yeah, that's what I thought. How's Dave? Uh huh. How oh, come now, a lover's quarrel. Hmm? Yes, yes, Albert does. Oh, that reminds me of something, too. I huh? What do you mean? Why does he refuse? Oh, isn't that silly? <laughs> well, I don't know if it'd help any, but I'll ask you. Huh? <laughs> see. Uh, hold on a minute. What? Never mind what? I wasn't looking for the glue. I'm talking on the phone. Honestly, hello, kitty. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll talk to you. I've got something to say about that myself. The other day I was cleaning out the... What? Yeah. Uh-huh, sure. Yeah, uh -huh. I found the glue. All right. Okay, Kitty. Yeah, when he comes over. There it is. Yeah, and I don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Yeah. Honestly, Kitty and David had a quarrel on the wedding of next week. Oh, what's the matter with him? Now, let's see what's wrong with this chair. Now, it chair. seems they had a quarrel over the wedding ring. <laughs> oh, why? What's the matter? Does she want a fancy, expensive one, no, no, I suppose? No, 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 not hers. No, no. It seems the trouble is over his wedding ring. <laughs> oh, 
Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, get out of my light, will you, honey? I can't see anything here. This chair's not too substantial, anyhow. Well, be careful with it. It belonged to my grandmother, and it's rather fragile now. I know it is. That's why I want to well, fix now, it. Well, now, listen, I want to tell you, it seems that Dave doesn't want to wear a wedding ring himself. Oh, well, they'll, they'll patch it up. Oh, my golly, all these rungs seem to be loose. Maybe I better fix this side, too. Anyhow, Kitty remembered that you wear a wedding ring, and she thought you might talk to Dave. Honey, you're standing right in my light. Oh, I'm sorry. Look, as, I, as long as I'm fussing with glue and everything, maybe I better take this all out to the kitchen and fix it out here, huh? Yeah, well, wait a minute. I'll come out, too. No. I'll talk to you. Honey, you, you don't have to yeah. come out. I can fix it. You trust me just to glue the rung in a chair, don't you? Oh, yes, dear. Well, but I want to talk all right, to you about if you're going to tag along, make yourself useful, will you? Got to have some newspapers put on the floor, and I don't want to get the blue all over the floor. Oh, here, here, here's one. It's last night. You read it, didn't you? Yep. Well, anyhow, about this wedding ring business. Oh, there's something I've been meaning to mention for some time, Albert. I've oh, noticed sh- that you don't... Sh- what? Isn't that Susie? Susie? No, I didn't hear anything. Oh, I thought maybe I heard it. Mm. Quiet just a minute, huh? I was just up there a few minutes ago. Don't you was sound asleep? Listen, I well, promise now, that you don't... Well, now, get the papers down. Albert! Uh, okay, I don't know what happened to it. I've lost it. And I noticed you weren't wearing it. Well, I apparently took it off and mislaid it, and I haven't said anything because I kept thinking I'd find it again. Oh, well, I assumed as much. I knew you probably felt badly about telling me you'd lost it. You sure you just mislaid it, dear, well, on the house? Well, yes, I, I just mislaid it. I looked uh-huh. high and low for it. Mm-hmm. You say I didn't say anything because... <laughs> well, well, no, what do you mean Kitty wants me to talk to Dave? Huh? Because that's what they've quarreled about. He doesn't want to wear a wedding ring, and she wants him to. She wants a double ring ceremony. For Pete's sakes, what difference does it make? Well, Kitty wants him to wear one. She's always liked the idea of her husband wearing a wedding well, ring. Well, you know. it seems to me he ought to have something to say about it. Women are always trying to make a man do something he doesn't want to do. Now, listen, I never tried to get you to have a double ring ceremony. I didn't care, and you knew it. I know, I it know. It was your mother that liked the idea. I yeah, all know right. it. I just remember it until you did it. I made her happy, and I, I sort of liked the idea anyhow. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. Be careful now. That chair's fragile. All right. Anyhow, Kitty wants you to talk to Dave. Well, I haven't got anything to say to Dave. That's his business. He's putting up this terrible fuss about wearing one, and Kitty thought maybe you could make him see your point of view, dear. My point of view? Yes, he's got all these crazy notions. Ham in a glue. Just see... Oh, here. After all, there's nothing really nicer than having your husband wear a wedding ring, too. I think it's a beautiful symbol. I mean, it's just as Muriel once said. Every time you see a man wearing a wedding ring, you always think... Well, there's a man who loves his wife so much he wants the whole world to know. What's the matter? Yeah, hand me one of those kitchen matches, will you? Uh, so I can put the glue on yeah, with it. Just a minute. Wasn't that what you think, dear, when you see a man wearing a wedding ring? Yeah, well, that's one way of looking at it. Well, I don't see if there's any other way of looking at it at all. After all, that's what a wedding ring stands for, a symbol of wedlock, of being bound in matrimony. You should have heard what Dave said to Kitty. Yeah, yeah what? Well, makes me so... glue all over Dave the said that when he sees a guy wearing a wedding ring, he thinks, boy, there's a hen-pecked husband. Can you imagine? Now, why would he think that? Can you imagine that? There's no accounting for so what man. people think. We're all entitled to our own opinion, you know? Well, I know, I know, but I don't see why a man wearing a wedding ring makes him seem hen-pecked. Oh, and another thing he said, it was just as though Kitty didn't trust him. Hey, look, honey, you want to hold this? That? Hang yeah. on right oh. here. Will you hold these two parts of the yeah, chair together? All right. All right. Tie it with a string. Oh, all right. And look, don't sit in this yeah. chair for a couple of days. No, I won't. All right. Did you hear that? He hmm. said it was just as though Kitty didn't trust him. See, where trusting him has anything to do with it. Have you ever heard of such nonsense? No. Well, yeah, I've heard of it. Well, what does it mean? Well, Dave's got a point. Just as though Kitty were branding him. Branding him? Well, I, I don't mean branding exactly. It's... It makes a wedding sound or some sort of a rodeo. Well, I didn't mean branding. I meant that it looks as though Kitty was saying, now you wear this wedding ring so all the girls you meet will know that you're a married man. Well? Well? Yes, is that bad? Oh, look, honey, let, let's stay out of this Kitty and Dave business, can't we? That's their problem. She's going to be calling in a few minutes as soon as he gets to her place and she wants you to talk to him now. I'm so going to get... say to him, it's his business. Now, dear, Come on, right. let's get this chair glued. Hang on to it tighter, will you? Right, the yeah. rung is slipping out. Hang All on. All right, hurry up. Get it tight. Yeah, wait a minute. Now, let me get this. I'm very good string. <clears throat> I want to have cord. Really. What's wrong with a girl looking at a man's hand and seeing a wedding ring and knowing that he's married? Well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's seems to me it's a good idea. Every yeah. married man ought to wear one, particularly in this day and age. 
Remember that Miss Kelly? She went out to dinner a couple of times with some man, and she didn't know he was married. Who's Miss Kelly? The girl in the dentist's mm -hmm. office. I think she sort of liked him, too. She said she thought it ought to be a law that men wear wedding rings. Hold on to the chair. I am. Yeah. All right, okay. okay. Uh, now, this other one. She said if you get... Yeah. She said if you get introduced to some nice man who seems like a perfect gentleman and he asks you out to dinner, you can't say, well, are you married? Well, if he's married, he hasn't got any business asking her out to dinner. Well, it would seem, dear, that whether he has any right to or not, that there are those who do, and you know it as well as I do. All you know, right. All Hang on to the side of the chair. Now, come on, hold it tight while I, I tie am. the string around it. All right. Just as Muriel said one time, even the happiest married man doesn't like to give other girls the idea that he is not eligible. Yeah? Yeah. I don't think it hasn't made me think twice about you sometimes, too. Oh, come on. Don't be so silly. Yeah, I remember the time you came home and asked me if you had that married look, and I said, why, and you said you overheard one of the new stenographers at the office ask Mabel if you were. Mabel said yes. And the girl said, I thought so. He has that married look. You oh, remember that? Remember well. that? He talked about it all evening. Oh, nonsense. Yes, you did. Ah! There, now. Now, let's uh, hope that holds. Now, look, put, that, uh, put the chair over here, see? Yeah. Now, don't sit on it, honey. Uh, Take 24 hours for that glue to yeah, really now, dry. Yeah, now, listen, when Dave calls, I wish you'd be gone. Look, I am not going to persuade tell. Dave to wear any wedding ring. I can't persuade him if I wanted to, and I don't want to anyhow. Why? Well, because he's probably made up his mind, and it's none of my business. There are plenty of men that feel that way. Oh, who? Well, Walt does, for one. Walt? Yeah. He's mentioned it a couple of times when he saw a wedding ring on some guy's hand. What did he mention? Well, he said that when a man wore a wedding ring, he always thought, well, there's a nandy pandy milk toast for you. Oh, well, Walt, he's always so cynical anyway. Yeah, just the same. Listen, all I want you to do is tell Dave that it hasn't hurt you any wearing a wedding ring and that you didn't mind it, that you... Did you? No, no, of course not. No, as soon as well, we get I on our feet it... financially, I mean... As soon as we have some extra money, I'll buy another one to replace the one that I didn't oh. Really oh, yeah, I got a surprise for you. What's the matter? Huh? <laughs> Come on in the other room. Come on, I want to show you something. What? Come here, here, here. A little box in the desk I put in here last night. I've been meaning to show you mine. I forgot. Until the night when Kitty <laughs> phoned about this. Here, your wedding ring. Wedding ring? <laughs> oh. Hey, well... You'd never guess where I found it, oh, honey. No, where, honey? Oh, I'll found, be done. I found it in the toe of that old pair of brown shoes of yours. No. <laughs> I wouldn't have found it for months if I hadn't gotten so disgusted with the mess on the closet before and I cleaned it out. I heard the little, ra little rattle in the shoes, you know, and here was the ring. Well, I'll be done. I must have oh, dropped down, you know, and landed yeah, in the shoes. I know. <laughs> What I thought. Oh. I thought that was the funniest thing. You're this little rattle, you know, and oh, that must be Kitty. She wants you to talk to David. Wasn't that crazy, my finding it like that? Yeah. I thought Albert's going to be so surprised when yeah. I tell him. Yeah, I'll be doggone. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hello. Yeah, yes, Kitty, he's right here. Put Dave on. Uh, okay. Here, honey, here. Now, just say anything, you know. I've got to run upstairs. I think but I did I, hear Susan. I don't want to talk to him. I mean, he won't listen to me anyhow. Yes, he will. I, tell him at, how you feel about it, dear. Uh, That's all you have. Hello. Oh, hello, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Common sense, huh? Yeah, logical reasoning. <laughs> well, look, I don't want to disillusion you, my boy. You'll be married in a week, and then you'll find out that logical reasoning with a woman is just finding a way of proving that she's right. <laughs> yeah, well, you stick to your guns while you still got a fighting chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least Albert is a good man to give advice. And speaking of advice, here's a tip for you. Henry Morgan's got the kind of humor that's like, well, it's like no other kind you've ever heard. It's original, and it's strictly from imagination. On the usual comedy show, you'd expect a 50-piece orchestra, a glamorous girl singer, and jokes that remind you of some you might have heard before. You get those on Morgan's show? Nope. You may get a bagpipe player, a yodeler, unusual music, plus Morgan zany humor. The fair warning before you become a dyed-in-the-wool Morgan fan, this is not a show to make you think. Morgan's likely to go into the importance of such subjects as how to squeeze toothpaste back into the tube, or any other subject that happens to pop into his mind. For a howling good time, hear the Henry Morgan Show when it comes your way tomorrow night over most of these ABC stations.
The Private Lives of Ethel and Albert come to you each weekday at this same time. The show is written by Peg Lynch, who plays the part of Ethel. Albert is played by Alan Bunce. The program is produced by Bob Cotton. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Oh, yeah. That just has that Vic and Sade feel to it. And a very good attempt. Peg Lynch uh, worked with, I believe, who was her husband, Alan Bunce. And they did a bunch of similar situation comedies in a short format. Uh, I forget the names of the others, but I'm sure I can uh, remember at some point. But well worth checking out. And uh, there are more episodes of this at thearchive.org, the source for a lot of great old-time radio, um, where most of where I acquisit the stuff that we present here. Um, And that Henry Morgan ad, the Henry Morgan show. And uh, he did another show of which, as far as I know, there's only three examples called Here's Morgan. And the Henry Morgan show, which featured such stellar luminaries as the great Arnold Stang, who, among other things, later did the voice of Top Cat in the noted Hanna-Barbera cartoons. I I was just nuts about everything I've ever heard uh, from Henry Morgan. Um, Kind of a protege of Fred Allen in a certain way. In fact, the first time I heard him, he was a guest on the Fred Allen Show. Fred Allen, for those of you who don't know, being, well, Jack Benny was the biggest show on radio, and Fred Allen, while he was never high in the ratings, was a adversary in certain ways. I mean, they had this feud that went on for years and years, and that's some of the funniest stuff that was on the Jack Benny show. And Allen was famous for um, his sardonic wit and He never really sold out, and what was remarkable about him is, while he had writers that he hired, he pretty much wrote and edited the scripts for every show of every radio program he did, which is a brilliant thing in and of himself. And he uh, later, he never made it on television, unlike Jack Benny, who had a long-running TV series. But until his death in the 50s, Uh, Fred Allen was on a lot of game shows, I believe, What's My Line, and I've Got a Secret, one or the other or both. I get those shows kind of mixed up sometimes, TV game shows, that is, but either of them are worth searching down and checking out episodes on the YouTube. And I know, I recommend more stuff than anybody could watch, but I sort of try to be a guide and presenter to many things that I appreciate and perhaps you too can appreciate. And speaking of stuff we can appreciate, and uh, I want to continue right here and now, our Murray Linster novel. So, uh, yeah, batten down the hatches and let's check this out. Part 2 of The Grandfather's War by Murray Linster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Information secure from others is invariably inaccurate in some fashion. A complete and reasoned statement of a series of events is almost necessarily trimmed and distorted and edited, or it would not appear reasonable and complete. Truly factual accounts of any series of happenings will, if honest, contain inconsistent or irrational elements. Reality is far too complex to be reduced to simple statements without much suppression of fact. Manual, Interstellar Medical Service, page 25. He was able to verify his guess about the means by which interstellar war became practical when the med ship was landed. Normally a landing grid was a gigantic, squat structure of steel girders half a mile high and a full mile in diameter. It rested upon bedrock, was cemented into unbreakable union with the substance of its planet, and tapped the ionosphere for power. When the med ship reached the abysmal darkness of the nearest planet's shadow, there were long, long pauses in which it hung apparently motionless in space. 
There were occasional vast swingings, as if something reached out and made sure where it was. And Calhoun made use of his nearest object indicator, and observed that something very huge fumbled about and presently became stationary in emptiness, and then moved swiftly and assuredly down into the blackness which was the planet's night side. When it and the planetary surface were one, the med ship began its swift descent in the grip of landing grid-type force fields. It landed in the center of a grid, but not a typical grid. This was more monstrous in size than any spaceport boasted. It was not squat, either, but as tall as it was wide. As the ship descended, he saw lights in a control system cell midway to the ground. It was amazing, but obvious. The med ship's captors had built a landing grid which was itself a spaceship. It was a grid which could cross the void between stars. It could wage offensive war. It's infernally simple, Calhoun told Murgatroyd distastefully. The regular landing grid hooks onto something in space and pulls it to the ground. This thing hooks onto something on the ground and pushes itself out into space. It'll travel by lawler or overdrive, and when it gets somewhere, it can lock onto any part of another world and pull itself down to that and stay anchored to it. Then it can land the fleet that traveled with it. It's partly a floating dry dock and partly a landing craft, and actually it's both. It's a ready-made spaceport anywhere it chooses to land, which means that it's the deadliest weapon in the past thousand years. Murgatroyd climbed on his lap and blinked wisely at the screens. They showed the surroundings of the now-grounded medship standing on its tail. There were innumerable stars overhead. All about there was the whiteness of snow. But there were lights. Ships at rest lay upon the icy ground. I suspect, growled Calhoun, that I could make a dash on emergency rockets and get behind the horizon before they could catch me. But this is just a regular military base. He considered his recent studies of historic wars, of battles and massacres and looting and rapine. Even modern civilized men would revert very swiftly to savagery once they had fought a battle. Enormities unthinkable at other times would occur promptly if men went back to barbarity. Such things might already be present in the minds of the crews of these spaceships. "'You and I, Murgatroyd,' said Calhoun, "'may be the only wholly rational men on this planet, and you aren't a man.' "'Gee!' shrilled Murgatroyd. He seemed glad of it. "'But we have to survey the situation before we attempt anything noble and useless,' Calhoun observed. "'But still, what's that?' He stared at a screen which showed lights on the ground moving toward the medship. They were carried by men on foot walking on the snow." As they grew nearer, it appeared that there were also weapons in the group. They were curious, ugly instruments, like sporting rifles, save that their bores were impossibly large. They would be... Calhoun searched his new store of information. They would be launchers of miniature rockets, capable of firing small missiles with shaped charges, which could wreck the medship easily. Thirty yards off, they separated to surround the ship. A single man advanced. "'I'm going to let him in, Murgatroyd,' observed Calhoun. "'In wartime, a man is expected to be polite to anything with a weapon capable of blowing him up. It's one of the laws of war.' He opened both the inner and outer lock doors. The glow from inside the ship shone out on white, untrodden snow. Calhoun stood in the opening, observing that as his breath went out of the outer opening, it turned to white mist. "'My name is Calhoun,' he said curtly to the single dark figure still approaching. "'Interstellar Medical Service. 
a neutral, a non-combatant, and at the moment very much annoyed by what has happened. A gray-bearded man with grim eyes advanced into the light from the opened port. He nodded. "'My name is Walker,' he said, as curtly. "'I suppose I'm the leader of this military expedition. At least my son is the leader of the, uh, the enemy, which makes me the logical man to direct the attack upon them.' Calhoun did not quite believe his ears, but he pricked them up. A father and son on opposite sides would hardly have been trusted by either faction, as warfare used to be conducted, and certainly their relationship would hardly be a special qualification for leadership at any time. He made a gesture of invitation, and the gray-bearded man climbed the ladder to the port. Somehow he did not lose the least trace of dignity in climbing. He stepped solidly into the airlock and on into the cabin of the ship. "'If I may, I'll close the lock doors,' said Calhoun. "'If your men won't misinterpret the action, it's cold outside.' The sturdy, bearded man shrugged his cape-clad shoulders. "'They'll blast your ship if you try to take off,' he said. "'They're in the mood to blast something.' With the same air of massive confidence he moved to a seat. Murgatroyd regarded him suspiciously. He ignored the little animal. "'Well?' he said impatiently. "'I'm med service,' said Calhoun. "'I can prove it. I should be neutral in whatever is happening. But I was asked for by the planetary government of Phaedra. I think it likely that your ships come from Phaedra. Your grid ship, in particular—' wouldn't be needed by the local citizens. How does the war go? The stocky man's eyes burned. Are you laughing at me? he demanded. I've been three months in overdrive, Calhoun reminded him. I haven't heard anything to laugh at in longer than that. No. The, uh, our enemy, uh, said Walker bitterly, consider that they have won the war but you may be able to make them realize that they have not and that they cannot. We have been foolishly patient, but we can't risk forbearance any longer. We mean to carry through to victory, even if we arrive at cutting our own throats for a victory celebration, and that is not unlikely. Calhoun raised his eyebrows, but he nodded. His studies had told him that a war psychology was a highly emotional one. Our home planet, Phaedra, had to be evacuated, said Walker, very grimly indeed. There are signs of instability in our sun. Five years since, we sent our older children to Canis Three to build a world for all of us to move to. Our sun could burst at any time. It is certain to flare up sometime, and soon. We sent our children because the place of danger was at home. We urged them to work feverishly. We sent the young women as well as the men at the beginning, so that if our planet did crisp and melt when our sun went off, there would still be children of our children to live on. When we dared, when they could feed and shelter them, we sent younger boys and girls to safety, overburdening the new colony with mouths to feed, but at least staying ourselves where the danger was. Later we sent even the small children, as the signs of an imminent cataclysm became more threatening. Calhoun nodded again. There were not many novas in the galaxy in any one year, even among the millions of billions of stars it held. But there had been at least one colony which had had to be shifted because of evidence of solar instability. The job in that case was not complete when the flare-up came. The evacuation of a world, though, would never be an easy task. The population had to be moved light years of distance. Space travel takes time, even at thirty times the speed of light. Where the time of disaster, the deadline for removal, could not be known exactly, the course adopted by Phaedra was logical. Young men and women were best sent off first. They could make new homes for themselves and for others to follow them. They could work harder and longer for the purpose than any other age group, and they would best assure the permanent survival of somebody. The new colony would have to be a place of frantic, unresting labor, of feverish, round-the-clock endeavor, 
because the time scale for working was necessarily unknown, but was extremely unlikely to be enough. When they could be burdened further, younger boys and girls would be shipped, old enough to help but not to pioneer. They could be sent to safety in a partly built colony. Later, smaller children could be sent, needing care from their older contemporaries. Only at long last would the adults leave their world for the new. They would stay where the danger was until all the younger ones were secure. But now, said Walker thickly, our children have made their world and now they refuse to receive their parents and grandparents. They have a world of young people only, under no authority but their own. They say that we lied to them about the coming flare of Phaedra's son, that we enslaved them and made them use their youth to build a new world we now demand to take over. They are willing for Phaedra's son to burst and kill the rest of us, so they can live as they please without a care for us. Calhoun said nothing. It is a part of medical training to recognize that information obtained from others is never wholly accurate. Conceding the facts, he would still be getting from Walker only one interpretation of them. There is an instinct in the young to become independent of adults, and an instinct in adults to be protective past all reason. There is, in one sense, always a war between the generations on all planets not only Phaedra and Canis III. It is a conflict between instincts which themselves are necessary, and perhaps the conflict as such is necessary for some purpose of the race. They grew tired of the effort building the colony required, said Walker, his eyes burning as before. So they decided to doubt its need. They sent some of their number back to Phaedra to verify our observations of the sun's behavior our observations. It happened that they came at a time when the disturbances in the sun were temporarily quiet. So our children decided that we were over-timid, that there was no danger to us, that we demanded too much. They refused to build more shelters and to clear and plant more land. They even refused to land more ships from Phaedra, lest we burden them with more mouths to feed. They declared for rest, for ease. They declared themselves independent of us. They disowned us, sharper than a serpent's tooth. There's an ungrateful child, said Calhoun. So I've heard. So you declared war. We did, raged Walker. We are men. Haven't we wives to protect? We'll fight even our children for the safety of their mothers. And we have grandchildren on Canis Three. What's happening and is happening there? What they're doing? He seemed to strangle on his fury. Our children are lost to us. They destroy us and our wives, and they destroy themselves. And they will destroy our grandchildren. <laughs> we fight. Murgatroyd climbed into Calhoun's lap and cuddled close to him. Tormals are peaceful little animals. The fury and bitterness in Walker's tone upset Murgatroyd. He took refuge from anger in closeness to Calhoun. "'So the war is between you and your children and grandchildren,' observed Calhoun. "'As a medshipman, what's happened to date? How has the fighting gone? What's the state of things right now?' "'We've accomplished nothing,' rasped Walker. "'We've been too soft-hearted.' We don't want to kill them, not even after what they've done. But they are willing to kill us. Only a week ago we sent a cruiser in to broadcast propaganda. We considered that there must be some decency left even in our children. No ship can use any drive close to a planet, of course. We sent the cruiser in on a course to form a parabolic semi-orbit, riding momentum down close to atmosphere above Canopolis where it would be broadcast on standard communication frequencies and go out to clear space again. But they used the landing grid to strew its path with rocks and boulders. It smashed into them. Its hull was punctured in fifty places. Every man died. 
Calhoun did not change expression. This was an interview to learn the facts of a situation in which the Med Service had been asked to act. It was not an occasion in which to be horrified. He said, What did you expect of the Med Service when you asked for its help? We thought, said Walker, very bitterly indeed, that we would have prisoners. We prepared hospital ships to tend our children who might be hurt. We wanted every possible aid in that, no matter what our children have done. Yet you have no prisoners? asked Calhoun. He didn't grasp this affair yet. It was too far out of the ordinary for quick judgment. Any war in modern times would have seemed strange enough, but a full-scale war between parents and children on a planetary scale was a little too much to grasp in all its implications in a hurry. We've won prisoner, said Walker scornfully. We caught him because we hoped to do something with him. We failed. You'll take him back. We don't want him. Before you go, you will be told our plans for fighting, for the destruction, if we must, of our own children. But it is better for us to destroy them than to let them destroy our grandchildren as they are doing. This accusation about grandchildren did not seem conceivably true. Calhoun, however, did not question it. He said reflectively, You're going about this affair in a queer fashion, whether as a war or an exercise in parental discipline. Sending word of your plans to one supposed enemy, for instance. Walker stood up, his cheek twitched. At any instant now, Phaedra's son may go. It may have done so since we heard. And our wives, our children's mothers, are on Phaedra. If our children have murdered them by refusing them refuge, then we will have nothing left but the right there was a pounding on the airlock door. I'm through, rasped Walker. He went to the lock and opened the doors. This medman, he said to those outside, will come and see what we've made ready. Then he'll take our prisoner back to Canis. He'll report what he knows. It may do some good. He stepped out of the airlock, flinging a command to Calhoun to follow. Calhoun grunted to himself. He opened a cabinet and donned heavy winter garments. Murgatroyd said, Chee! in alarm, when it appeared that Calhoun was going to leave him. Calhoun snapped his fingers, and Murgatroyd leaped up into his arms. Calhoun tucked him under his coat and followed Walker down into the snow. This undoubtedly was the next planet out from the colonized Canis III. It would be Canis IV, and a very small excess of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere would keep it warmer, by the greenhouse effect, than its distance from the local sun would otherwise imply. The snow was winter snow only. This was not too cold a base for military operations against the planet next inward toward the sun. Walker strode ahead toward the rows of spaceship hulls about the singularly spidery grip ship. It occurred to Calhoun that astrogating such a ship would be very much like handling an oversized, open-ended wastebasket. A monstrous overdrive field would be needed, and keeping its metal above the brittle point on any really long space voyage would be difficult indeed. But it was here. It had undoubtedly lifted itself from Phaedra. It had landed itself here and should be able to land on Canis, and then let down, after itself, the war fleet now clustered about its base. But Calhoun tried to take comfort in the difficulty of traveling really long distances, up in the tens of twenties of light years, with such a creation. Possibly, just possibly, warfare would still be limited to relatively nearby worlds. We thought, rumbled Walker, that we might excavate shelters here so we could bring the rest of Phaedra's population here to wait out the war, so they'd be safe if Phaedra's sun blew. But we couldn't feed them all, so we have to blast a reception for ourselves on the world our children have made. They came to a ship which was larger than any except the grid ship. Nearly half its hull had been opened, and a gigantic 
tent set up against it. It was a huge machine shop. A spaceship inside was evidently the cruiser of which Walker had spoken. Calhoun could see where ragged old holes had been made in its hull. Men of middle age or older worked upon it with a somewhat dogged air. But Walker pointed to another object, almost half the size of the medship. Men worked on that, too. It was a missile, not man-carrying, with relatively enormous fuel capacity for its drive rockets. "'Look that over,' commanded Walker. "'That's a rocket missile, a robot-fighting machine that will start from space with plenty of rocket fuel for maneuvering. It will fight and dodge its way down into the middle of the grid at Canopolis, which our children refuse to use to land their parents. In three days from now, we use this to blast that grid, and as much as Canopolis as may go with it from the blast of a megaton bomb. Then our grid ship will land, and our fleet will follow it down and we'll be aground on Canis with blast rifles and flame and more bombs to fight for our rightful foothold on our children's world. When our fighting men are landed, our ships will begin to bring in our wives from Phaedra, if they are still alive, while we fight to make them safe. We'll fight our children as if they were wild beasts, the way they've treated us. We begin this fight in just three days, when that missile is ready and tested. If they kill us, so much the better. But we'll make them do their murder with their hands, with their guns, with the weapons they've doubtless made. But they shall not murder us by disowning us. And if we have to kill them to save our grandchildren, we begin to do so in just three days. Take them that message. Calhoun said, I'm afraid they won't believe me. They'll learn they must, growled Walker. Then he said abruptly, What repairs does your ship need? We'll bring it here and repair it, and then you'll take our prisoner and carry him and your message back to his own kind. Our children. The irony and the fury and the frustration in his tone, as he said, children, made Murgatroyd wriggle underneath Calhoun's coat. I find, said Calhoun, that all I need is power. You drained my overdrive charges when you snatched my ship out of overdrive. I've extra Duhaney cells, but one overdrive charge is a lot of power to lose. You'll get it back, growled Walker. Then take the prisoner and our warning to Canis. Get them to surrender if you can. Calhoun considered. Under his coat, Murgatroyd said, Chee, chee, in a tone of some indignation. Thinking of the way of my own father with me, said Calhoun wryly, and accepting your story itself is quite true, how the devil can I make your children believe that this time you aren't bluffing? Haven't you bluffed before? We've threatened, said Walker, his eyes blazing. Yes, and we were too soft-hearted to carry out our threats. We've tried everything short of force. But the time has come— when we have to be ruthless, we have our wives to consider. Whom, observed Calhoun, I suspect you didn't dare have with you because they wouldn't let you actually fight, no matter what your sons and daughters did. But they're not here now, raged Walker, and nothing will stop us. Calhoun nodded. In view of the situation as a whole, he almost believed it, of the fathers of the colonists on Canis III. But he wouldn't have believed it of his own father, regardless, and he did not think the young people of Canis would believe it of theirs. Yet there was nothing else for them to do. It looked like he traveled three months in overdrive and painstakingly studied much distressing information about the ancestors of modern men, only to arrive at and witness the most heart-rending conflict in human history. End of part two. Oh, man, I hope you're digging that as much as I am. That Linster and Phil Chenever just make such a perfect combination. Because you can tell Phil really, really loves Linster's work. He's read so many of them on LibriVox. And those, of course, 
if you're not familiar with LibriVox, they have a huge library of public domain material, audiobooks that volunteers read. And yes, some of them are read by uh, lesser quality uh, readers, but there's a lot of good readers and more and more every year, uh, thousands, and they are also duplicated on archive.org. So that's still, that makes archive.org really your one-stop place for all things amazing audio. Um, these audio books are just delicious. And before we part company, we will hear the uh, third chapter of that book, and then chapters four, five, and six will appear on the Big Appreciation Showcase number six. That's the plan, and uh, we're, I'm sticking with it. Up next, yeah, you probably guessed it, or you read it in the show notes. Um, yeah, I can't get enough of Jimbo lately. He makes me smile, and uh, I, I, I miss the guy so much. So uh, what we have is uh, just a few weeks after the Overnightscape episode that we enjoyed just a little while ago, Jimbo recorded an episode called Glass. That is uh, November 7th, 2016, and uh, some vintage Jimbo that should cure all of our ills. Let's listen. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody, it's Jimbo. It's Jimbo. Hey, everybody. So, this is the day after the time change, and it's a beautiful day out here. Sun be shining right here on the porch, and got the dogs out here with me. They love the sunshine and the porch. We're out here enjoying it together. Little breeze out here, about 73 degrees. The wind chill, probably about 68 or so. It's pretty nice. And the sun's beating down, so. I'm getting some vitamin D or vitamin A or whatever it is. <laughs> vitamin D. Whatever it is. You know, I found out one time that sunshine can do something that nothing else can. For instance, uh, I used to have this uh, white bowl. And I would eat spaghetti in this white bowl. And you know what? It stained the bowl red from the tomato sauce. It just stained it. And I had... I tried bleach and bleach would not get it out and tried washing it in dishwasher with bleach and all kinds of, nothing would work. And one day I was uh, transporting dishes from my house to my sister's house for she wanted to borrow some dishes. Accidentally left that dish outside and the sun bleached it completely white and I found out that the only way to remove that tomato stain from that bowl was the wholesomeness of the sun. The wholesomeness of the sun. It worked. It was amazing. And I've told others and they poo-poo the idea like, uh, Jimbo, you must be crazy. You must be out of your mind. Uh, not going to put any dishes in the sun. Oh, here comes the noise and dogs will probably bark. So be careful. Uh, be, be prepared for this eventuality. If they do bark. Aha, but they did not. Uh, why didn't you bark? Uh, you little bitches. They're, they're female dogs. I can call them that because that's what they are. A female dog is a bitch. You bitch. Hey, you bitches. You bitches. You know, that's, that's funny. The, the actual 
actual words are not used for their real purpose anymore. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for instance, you could look up the word uh, bastard in the dictionary, and it tells you that a bastard is uh, someone who uh, doesn't have an Ill illegitimate father, you know, it was born illegitimately, and he's a bastard. And so if you call somebody, like somebody you know now that doesn't have a dad, yeah, you bastard. And they, they don't have any idea that you're calling them truthfully what they are, a bastard. Uh, other words that are not used properly anymore. Uh, the words change over time. They just do. So, these little dogs, I guess you could call them bitches, but is that proper anymore? I don't know. You know, the the PC police. come and get you if you don't say the right words. Uh, mm, they will. Like, for instance, I'm fat. I'm fat. What, I mean, you know, it's okay to make fun of fat people because, I don't know, it just is. It's okay if you call somebody fat. And uh, that's, that's okay. Hey, fatty. Hey, fatso. It's okay if you call somebody fat. But don't call them a bastard. Or don't call them, uh, you know, a bastard as in illegitimate because that's that's just wrong. Uh, it's in the dictionary. And <laughs> you bastard. Let's see, I uh, started this earlier this monologue, and I had to restart. And one of the things I talked about was, uh, I don't know why I was talking about it, but Family Feud and the Family Feud hosts throughout the years. I used to watch Family Feud in the 70s uh, when Richard Dawson was the host. How and why did he ever get this gig as host of this show. Number one, is it's a game show. Richard Dawson's not a game show kind of guy. I mean, he did uh, The Running Man where he was a game show host, I suppose. But no, Richard Dawson, Hogan's Heroes, uh, always played a womanizer kind of person. Uh, what month of pregnancy does a woman begin to look pregnant? September. And of course, uh, Family Feud, uh, he... <laughs> he was kind of a womanizer on there. He's kind of a, um, I don't know. Did he really want to kiss all those women? Did he really, what was going on behind the scenes there? I'd like to know. There's got to be a book somewhere that tells. You know it wasn't all family feuding, you know what I'm saying? Name part of the telephone. The bottom part. Just like Pat Sajak and Vanna White, you know that even though Pat Sajak is a major conservative, uh, politically anyway, on Twitter, he's, you know, very funny guy, really funny. On Twitter, he's real funny. He makes, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if he comes up with his own little quips on there, but I'm, I guess he's thinking all day what, what he's going to write before he writes. He only tweets one time a day, and it's very funny. It'll always be very topical, usually about the election these days. And <laughs> he doesn't like either candidate, I don't think. And he's very conservative. So it's like me. He's a, he's conservative like me, and yet he doesn't like either of the candidates. Now, there's a lesser of two evils, of course, but have you been reading these WikiLeaks? I mean, come on. <sighs> My goodness. Uh, apparently, Chelsea uh, 
paid for her entire wedding and her life for the last 10 years via the Clinton Foundation. And, and nobody cares. Nobody's saying a word about it. Why not? And this whole thing with the spirit cooking, did you read about that? The spirit cooking, where they used uh, urine and uh, breast milk and sperm and blood or whatever and put it in food and they invited people over and they ate this stuff. And this was all, I mean, I don't think Hillary was the main instigator in all this, but she was, it's all part of her foundation and uh, the whole John Podesta thing and her campaign manager and the blah, 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 all this mess. Uh, you know, they call her, they call her, um, uh, airplane broomstick one because she's a witch, not just a fancy dancy witch, uh, not a fake witch, not a Halloween witch. I think she's really a witch. <laughs> uh, uh. Now, a lot of you would think uh, witchcraft is no big deal or whatever. I, I know a lot of people who are into the occult uh, that think the occult is uh, all fun and games. But, you know, I dare any of you who are into the occult to get out a Ouija board and play with the Ouija board. Come on, I dare you. Go ahead. Open up that... Uh, Go ahead. Do open up that con that continuum to the other dimension. I dare you. A lot of people don't think the other dimension is real. It is real. Very real. You really don't see a whole lot of intelligent people playing with Ouija boards. It's always the dumb children playing with the Ouija board. Uh, they make it. They design it uh, for kids it's a it's a board game you can go to the toys r us and buy it for goodness sakes right why is that because adults are smart enough not to play with that stuff maybe i'm wearing a brand new pair of shorts today if i didn't mention this already a pair of red shorts with the gray shirt I look like an athletic person i probably talked about this already i did another monologue earlier so I forgot what was on there. And what was on here, I don't know. One one for the other. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't remember. That's a bad thing. <sighs> Excuse me. Mm, this time change has got me all screwed up. Last night at 9 o'clock, I was starting to get tired and sleepy. I was like, ah, it's 9 o'clock. I've got to go to sleep. You know, I haven't set my clock yet. Uh, my clock is still an hour ahead. Uh, not sure why I've done that. I haven't set it yet, but... Uh, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't do that. I guess I'm... <clears throat> just too lazy. <laughs> Get too lazy to do all kinds of stuff these days. Uh, the other day, uh, I, or last week, I wore a shirt for like three days in a row. And uh, it was ridiculous. My brother even said something to him. Hey, aren't you going to change your shirt? Uh, I'm sorry. I guess I will. Uh, guess so. I have to. <laughs> Things you do when you're single, right? How you people that are married, uh... <laughs> no, I remember what it's like to be married. And I talk about that on the next Central. Uh, talk about disappointment, I believe. And uh, so you can listen to that and hear a little bit more about me talking about being married. So I won't go into that here. Uh, I won't go into that here. I can do this voice here.
if I needed to do another voice that I haven't done yet, here's a voice that I could do. Hello, how are you today? Well, it's good to see you here in Hometownville. <laughs> yeah. My name's Herbert, and uh, I rent votes down at the boat yard. <laughs> Would you like to buy a canoe? Would you like to rent a canoe for me? Because I got some canoes out. Rent you for a good price. Good price. I don't know what he would do with this Herbert guy. <laughs> but here's Herbert in case I need to do Herbert. I didn't even see. I didn't even realize I could do that until just now. What other voices could I do? I could do this guy. Hi, how are you? How are you doing today? It's good to see you here in Hometownville. And I'm, uh, my name's Ned, and I run the pizza place. I run the pizza place, and Top eats pizza almost every day. Him and his wife get pizza delivered almost every day. We don't really talk about that on Home Down Bill, but we need to. And I'm Ned, the pizza guy. Hello, this is Ned the Pizza Guy. How can I help you? <laughs> Didn't really know I could do that till now. Let's see, what else can I do? Uh... <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Lester. <laughs> I'm Lester. And what does Lester do? <laughs> Lester sells shoes. <laughs> Would you like to buy some shoes? I'm Lester, the shoe seller. <laughs> Just put your foot in here, ma'am. <laughs> you have a, a lovely foot. <laughs> I didn't even know I could do Lester. See, so. Who else can I do? <laughs> Pardon me. Pardon me, I didn't realize that I could do this voice. Uh, this wonderful voice here. Of the businessman. Hi, I'm Jim the businessman. It's business time. Uh, it perhaps sings a bit. Uh, but he's got this very distinctive voice, like a suave kind of... Uh, and that's the kind of voice he has. Jim the businessman. Would you like to do some business with me, uh, CPO Petri? Because I could do some business with you, sir. And you, Tup. Oh, good to see you, Tup. I could do some business with you, Tup. I could. <laughs> I could do some business with you, sir. What kind of business? I really don't know. I may have some more voices. Let's see. Let's see what other kind of voices I have. I have this voice here running well as I have. It's kind of a uh, little boy voice. Uh, like a teenager, perhaps. Uh, my name's Milton. Milton. What does Milton do? I don't know. The little girl, the, the girls must come over here when I did Milton's voice. <laughs> you like Milton? Milton. His name could be Milton Bradley, perhaps. Milton Bradley. And what does Milton Bradley do? <laughs> I'm Milton Bradley, and I'm a school tutor. No, he's probably mischievous. What would Milton do, uh... Milton uh, could be the, hmm, Milton, Milton, I don't know. Oh, the girls want some love, and it's hard not to give the girls love, and when they come over here and just offer themselves to you, like, take me and use me as fodder in your hands, Mr. Clayman. 
and mail and mailed me into the the puppy you want me to be. That's what I'm doing. You're a good baby. I do love these dogs very much. You know, I mentioned this before, but uh, when you don't have somebody to give affection to, these dogs are wonderful. Because you can give them affection. No, not sexual affection. No, not love, not kisses, not real kisses. But you can give them love. And look, big girls like looking at me like, I want your love and I want you to say good things about me. Because, you know, dogs are people too, right? I only wish that I could go out and run around with the doggies and I cannot do that. Because they need to just get out and run around and go crazy and I can't do that. I don't have a little girl or a little boy to send out with the dogs to run around, which is really unfortunate. Mm. Really unfortunate. And uh, again, I talk about uh, children a little bit uh, in the Central as a disappointment. I, you know, I'm not really sure that not having kids is a disappointment. I don't want to know, what would I do with a kid? Now, I suspect if I had a kid, the kid would be all grown up. But the kid would be over here all the time wanting money and blah, blah, blah. I don't want all that. No, do your own stuff. What are you doing? You know, when I got to be 18 years old, I moved out of the house. When I was 18, I moved out. Got my own apartment about uh, a month later or so. Got me a job, got me an apartment. Yeah, it was tough. When I was 18, I did not have a car right away. I had to walk everywhere. In Amarillo, where it was snowy and cold and... Uh, I remember there was one job I had where I had to walk like five or six miles to work back and forth. And I'm not kidding. I probably could have took a bus. But you know what? I was so stupid. And this is the honest to God's truth. I was so stupid. I didn't know. I didn't even think about taking the bus. <laughs> and, I, you know, something. I didn't mind walking. I didn't mind walking five or six miles. Okay, it took a couple of hours. I don't really remember. But it didn't bother me. I kind of liked walking. It was kind of fun. Uh, when I walked, I could think about stuff. I could, I could see what was going on around me. Take deep breaths. and It's good for you to walk. I mean, look at Frank. He walks every day. He's in great shape. I mean, heck, he can smoke cigars and doesn't even bother him because he walks every day. You know, I mean, that's got to be good for you. And I was doing that and uh, living on my own and at 18, 19 years old. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, at that age, without a car, it's tough to have a girlfriend. But I had girlfriends. I had... Uh, Three or four, I guess, uh, during that time, uh, you know, for good periods of time. They never work out uh, at that age, or very rarely. I think if you find a girlfriend at that age that you actually marry, that you're really not playing the field. You're just picking up the first thing that comes along. And I was thinking the other day, between the ages of 16, 17, 18, I had a lot of girlfriends. I did have this one girlfriend that I really thought I was in love with and I probably was in love with, actually, but I goofed up, and uh, when you goof up, you pay the price. And She had moved away, but I don't think that made any difference. Uh, boy, you have those regrets, you know. Just start thinking about the past. You start thinking about the past. Sometimes that's not a good thing. 
I think maybe one of the keys to being happy is not thinking about the things that could have been. Just forgetting that past and go on with your life. Sure, there's a million things I could have done different in my life, certainly. <laughs> we all could have done stuff different. But uh, it maybe it's just best just to go on and not go back. Go back, there's nothing there. Except um, things you can't change. You know, I made the mistake here not four or five years ago of getting out my wedding album and looking at all the pictures. And, you know, that did not really bother me so much as uh, when I got finished with it. I started just thinking about the past and all the things I could have done differently and... The other day I was talking about disappointment on the central and I recorded that and you'll hear it and that got me thinking about the past and I was like, ah, I don't want to think about the past. Yeah, the you just can't do nothing about the doggone past. So don't think about it. Just keep going forward. Be all that you can be now. What can I be? I can't be. I'm not much. I'm, you know, I'm just finding out some things I can do. I'm exploring myself. I'm, I'm realizing that maybe I can write skits a little bit. And maybe I can be uh, funny. And maybe I can produce a show and... I don't know. I don't know if uh, this two-bit show is worth much at all, but um, I'm having fun doing Hometownville. I miss doing Hey Everybody, It's Jimbo. Oh, the baby wants her belly rubbed. Is your belly rubbed? Mm. And you know what? I got a a beautiful day to sit out here and enjoy this weather and this breeze and uh, the sunshine and tomorrow's the elections and things may completely change after the elections. We really don't know what's happening. We've heard that tomorrow, as, as tomorrow being Tuesday, that perhaps there will be a massive or some sort of ISIS attack tomorrow. You know, who knows how that could change things. You realize how 9-11 changed uh, the airline industry and how it changed New York City and how it changed the Pentagon and how it changed... Uh, I mean, everything from bottled water on your flights to shoes to x-rays to um, all kinds of things. What will the next 9-11 be like? You know, will it change the way your kids go to school? Will it change the way you go to work and the things that happen at your job? Will it change the way we vote in the next election, if there is a next election? You know, what will it change? It could change everything. So, enjoy what you have now and be what you can be today because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. 
You don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. Maybe it's you that gets wiped out tomorrow. Maybe it's me that gets wiped out tomorrow. Maybe the electricity or the internet goes out tomorrow. Maybe we never get to do another hometownville. Maybe we don't have electricity for the next six months. Maybe they have a harp weapon that they can use to create an earthquake that's going to destroy the entire West Coast and all my West Coast friends will die and perhaps a tsunami will kill everybody on the East Coast and we'll all die. I lost a knife. I have a hunting knife and it's very sharp and I use it all the time. I keep it right next to my chair in the living room and it's missing. So I must have done something with it, like lost it. I'm a, I keep a, being afraid I'm going to step on the knife and it's going to cut me. Which, by the way, the other day there was a little Coca-Cola glass. A little one. Like about a six-ounce glass. It says Coca-Cola on it. It's got a Coca-Cola logo. And it's been around a while, and I've noticed it. it's not mine, so I assume it's my brother's. And I suppose he uses it all the time. Now, why would anybody use a six-ounce glass for anything? I have no idea, because <laughs> that's not enough to wet your whistle, as far as I'm concerned. But he uses it, and I, I notice that he washes it all the time. He takes care of it. He doesn't want it to get broken. So he does not entrust the glass to me to wash. He washes it himself, which is fine. I've got no problem at all with that because I don't give a crap one way or another. But the other day, I went in there and, barefooted, by the way, I stepped on something on the floor that broke. I had no idea what it was. I looked around and could not see what it was that broke until I turned on the light and saw that I had stepped on a big old piece of glass. You know how a glass is curved, it was upside down and I or it was on it was right side up rather, and I stepped on it and broke it and I, by the grace of God I did not cut my foot wide open. Then I began looking around and saw other pieces of glass strewn about the floor. Very large pieces that I could have uh, hurt myself very badly on and did not. So I started to look around and lo and behold, I found the glass on the cabinet. It had been broken. <laughs> and I realized that I could have been cut, and I, I was not, and the glass was on the counter, broken in uh, several pieces, and so later on, I asked my brother, I said, uh, hey, I noticed there's a Coke glass in there broken, you must have broken it, and uh, I stepped on it, but I didn't get cut, I said, uh, you didn't look very good, it's the pieces on the floor, and I didn't drop any glass, he said. Well, there's no, been nobody else over here. I said, well, I didn't drop the glass. I don't ever touch your glass. Well, I didn't do it, he says. I said, well, if I didn't do it and you didn't do it, then who did it? He says, I don't know. I didn't do it. I said, uh, if you didn't do it and I didn't do it, then who did it? I don't know. I didn't do it. Uh, I said, well, the glass is put up on the counter. It was broken, and somebody realized they broke it, and they put it on the counter. And he said, look, 
I'll take the blame for it. And I said, well, don't take the blame for it if you didn't do it. I'll take the blame for it. I said, okay, you'll take the blame for it. But if you didn't do it, who did it? I'll take the blame for it. I guess that was his way of saying that he did it and he wasn't going to admit that he did it. I guess. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. But I'm going to stop now. And that's going to be the end of this. Uh, thank you for listening. And I hope I get to talk to you another time. Thank you. Bye. Adios. And, and I hope you dig in at as much as I am of hey everybody it's Linster it is Kyle just shan of a little just unfocused perfect but combination because you can tell Phil and the real town villa really loves Linster's work he's raised so more men than Librivox and those of course Jimbo create not familiar with Librivox they have a huge wide characters of public amateur material host audio segments that volunteer to read. But yet some of them are read to specialize considering lesser is quality production facility readers. But there's a lot of good readers and more and more every year near thousands. And they are also duplicated on hereyma.org. So that that's still uh, that yeah, makes archive.org down real joy. You're one stop about Lambo for by all things and sure him amazing with audio or these audio books. I, I like are this just thing. delicious. He, he was, uh, we part company. We uh, will Chris G. I so I uh, like third uh, chapter uh, of that book after and then is. chapters uh, four to five and town six will, will appear on the big appreciation. I don't think that show ever a C thing number like Sing sound belts the plan curious out of our get picking with character pieces. Um, up next and sound because effects. he's going away I he feel uh, kind of kind of very excited about it and doing all sorts of voices and getting us to try all sorts of voices up next yeah and you know he sort of locked me really when I did a solar nax and yeah I can't I have a few of those I like at least he makes me I, I've never caught a phone and uh, I've never I called him a lot too so much. much but sometimes I could oh, really yeah. fall into it like, just a few a weeks after Duris is the overnightscape and nowadays that we enjoy start going into the little while ago people Jim getting recorded in that unappreciative Glass. You don't make them fun of me. Remember what you talking funny for? Well, I only talk to my dad and you're just making it fun. fun. Jimbo, uh, that you should cure. We, we've all become ills. Let's Over the last five, six years, a little more thin-skinned than we were. I mean, back in the 70s, we had people like Don Rickles who would just rip people to pieces and they'd appreciate it. You know, and now uh, you try doing that to someone. He was great. They used to have these celebrity roasts on TV, and Dean Martin, if you know who he was, used to host them, and they would just tear somebody a new behind, and it, it, that that was cool. They, they they took the jokes, they dug back a little. Um, I don't think you can do that anymore in 2023. And then, uh, of course, because it was that same time as uh, the Overnightscape episode with Frank Rule and Manny we just heard, Jimbo threw his two cents in in that 2016 election that definitely changed all of our lives. I think that changed the whole world, what happened there, and that uh, all the rumors and, uh, God, that was just the sloggiest election, I think, in the history. I don't even think 2020 got that bad, but it, that's not what we're here for. More um, the, the, the voices... And uh, the, to him talking about war, I'm thinking of Jimbo as a young guy is kind of interesting because I only knew him after his health had kind of failed. And he lived, you know, with his brother in a house in Georgia, made his podcasts and just kind of laid back. And there's some episodes he does go into more depth about his health. And like he said at the end of that, he hopes to do another show, which in retrospect, I mean, you didn't think too much about it. But you kind of did and should have maybe because uh, I think like uh, his days were numbered from the time he started, to be honest. And like I, I am just happy he left us this legacy in sound uh, once again uh, from 2016. And 
I don't know. That this whole political thing, which is inevitable when digging through the archives, I, I'd like to avoid it and that sort of thing because we're here to kind of escape dull care and enjoy the night radio, but that is an essential element to a certain degree, and as long as we don't overdwell there, I suppose it's just another part of the whole the whole thing, W-H-O-L, not falling into a hole, which, like I say, that could very easily occur. Um, let's see. We have the third chapter of our Murray Linster novel, so uh, let's listen to that and um, see what else we're going to do before we part company and uh, slap a lid on this fourth Big Appreciation Showcase. Part three of The Grandfather's War by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three. The fact that one statement agrees with another statement does not mean that both must be true. Too close an agreement may be proof that both statements are false. Conversely, conflicting statements may tend to prove each other's verity if the conflict is in their interpretations of the fact they narrate. Manual, Interstellar Medical Service, page 43. They brought the prisoner a bare hour later. Sturdy, grizzled men had strung a line to the med ship's power bank, and there was that small humming sound which nobody quite understands as power flowed into the Duhaney cells. The power men regarded the inside of the ship without curiosity, as if too much absorbed in private bitterness to be interested in anything else. When they had gone, a small guard brought the prisoner. Calhoun noted the expression on the faces of these men, too. They hated their prisoner. But their faces showed the deep and wrenching bitterness a man does feel when his children have abandoned him for companions he considers worthless or worse. A man hates those companions corrosively, and these men hated their prisoner. But they could not help knowing that he also had abandoned some other father whose feelings were like their own. So there was frustration even in their fury. The prisoner came lightly up the ladder into the med ship. He was a very young man, with a singularly fair complexion and a carriage at once challengingly jaunty and defiant. Calhoun estimated his age as seven years less than his own, and immediately considered him irritatingly callow and immature because of it. "'You're my jailer, eh?' said the prisoner brightly, as he entered the medship's cabin. "'Or is this some new trick? They say they're sending me back. I doubt it.' "'It's true enough,' said Calhoun. "'Will you dog the airlock door, please? Do that, and we'll take off.' The young man looked at him brightly. He grinned. "'No,' he said happily. "'I won't.' Calhoun felt ignoble rage. There had been no great purpose in his request. There could be none in the refusal. So he took the prisoner by the collar and walked him into the airlock. "'We are going to be lifted soon,' he said gently. "'If the outer door isn't dogged, the air will escape from the lock. When it does, you will die.' I can't save you, because if the outer door isn't dogged, all the air in the ship will go if I should try to help you. Therefore, I advise you to dog the door. He closed the inner door. He looked sick. Murgatroyd looked alarmedly at him. If I have to deal with that kind, Calhoun told the Tormal, I have to have some evidence that I mean what I say. If I don't, they'll be classing me with their fathers. The med ship stirred. Calhoun glanced at the external field dial. The mobile landing grid was locking its force field on. The little ship lifted. It went up and up and up. Calhoun looked sicker. The air in the lock was thinning swiftly. Two miles high. Three. There were frantic metallic clangings. The indicator said that the outer door was dogged tight. Calhoun opened the inner door. The young man stumbled in, shockingly white and gasping for breath. 
Thanks, said Calhoun curtly. He strapped himself in the control chair. The vision screens showed half the universe pure darkness and the rest a blaze of many-colored specks of light. They showed new stars appearing at the edge of the monstrous blackness. The Med Ship was rising ever more swiftly. Presently the black area was not half the universe. It was a third. Then a fifth. A tenth. It was a disk of pure darkness in a glory of myriad distant suns. The external field indicator dropped abruptly to zero. The med ship was afloat in clear space. Calhoun tried the Lawler drive tentatively. It worked. The med ship swung in a vast curved course out of the dark planet's shadow. There was the sun, Canis, flaming in space. Calhoun made brisk observations, set a new course, and the ship sped on with an unfelt acceleration. This was, of course, the Lawler propulsion system, used for distances which were mere millions of miles. When the ship was entirely on automatic control, Calhoun swung around to his unwilling companion. Murgatroyd was regarding the youthful stranger with intense curiosity. He looked at Calhoun with some apprehension. "'My name's Calhoun,' Calhoun told him. "'I'm Med Service. There's Murgatroyd. He's a Tormal. Who are you, and how did you get captured?' The prisoner went instantly into a pose of jaunty defiance. "'My name is Fredericks,' he said blandly. "'What happens next?' "'I'm headed for Canis Three, said Calhoun, "'in part to land you, in part to try to do something about this war. "'How'd you get captured?' "'They made a raid,' said young Fredericks scornfully. "'They landed a rocket out in open country. "'We thought it was another propaganda bomb like they'd landed before, "'telling us we were scoundrels and such bilge. "'I went to see if there was something in it good for a laugh.' But it was bigger than usual. I didn't know, but men had landed in it. They jumped me, two of them. Piled me in the rocket, and it took off. Then we were picked up and brought where you landed. They tried to mind-launder me. He laughed derisively, <laughs> showing me science stuff proving Phaedra's sun was going to blow and cook the old home planet, lecturing me that we were all fools on Canis, undutiful sons, and so on saying that to kill our parents wouldn't pay. "'Would it?' asked Calhoun. "'Pay, that is?' Fredericks grinned in a superior manner. "'You're pulling more of it, huh? I don't know science, but I know they've been lying to us. Look, they sent the first gang to Canis five years ago. Didn't send equipment with them, no more than they had to. Packed the ships full of people.' They were twenty years old and so on. They had to sweat, had to sweat out oars and make equipment and try to build shelters and plant food. There were more of them arriving all the time, shipped away from Phaedra with starvation rations so more of them could be shipped. All young people, remember. They had to sweat to keep from starving, with all the new ones coming all the time. Everybody had to pitch in the minute they got there. You never heard that, did you? Yes, said Calhoun. They worked plenty, said Frederick scornfully. Good little girls and boys. When they got nearly caught up and figured that maybe in another month they could breathe easy, why, then the old folks on Phaedra began to ship younger kids. Me a mom. I was fifteen, and we hit Canis like a flood. There wasn't shelter or food or clothes to spare. But they had to feed us. So we had to help by working, and I worked. I built houses and graded streets and wrestled pipe for plumbing and sewerage. The older boys were making it. And I planted ground and I chopped trees. No loafing, no fun. They piled us on canis so fast it was root hog or die. And we rooted. Then, just when we began to think that we could begin to take a breather, they started dumping little kids on us, ten-year-olds and nine-year-olds, to be fed and watched. 
<laughs> Seven-year-olds to have their noses wiped. No fun, no rest. He made an angry spitting noise. Did they tell you that? he demanded. Yes, agreed Calhoun. I heard that and more. All the time, raged Fredericks sullenly. They were yelling at us that the sun back home was swelling. It was wobbling. It was throbbing like it was going to burst any minute. They kept us scared that any second the ships had stopped coming because there wasn't any more Phaedra. And we were good little boys and girls, and we worked like hell. We tried to build what the kids they sent us needed, and they kept sending younger and younger kids. We got to the crack-up point. We couldn't keep it up. Night, day, every day, no fun, no loafing, nothing to do but work till you dropped, and then get up and work till you dropped again. He stopped. Calhoun said, So you stopped believing that it could be that urgent. You sent some messengers back to check and see, and Phaedra's son looked perfectly normal to them. There was no visible danger. The older folks showed their scientific records, and your messengers didn't believe them. They decided they were faked. They were tired. All of you were tired. Young people need fun. You weren't having it. So when your messengers came back and said the emergency was a lie, you believed them. You believed the older people were simply dumping all their burdens on you by lies. We knew it, rasped Fredericks. So we quit. We'd done our stuff. We were going to take time out and do some living. We were away back on having fun. We were away back on rest. <laughs> we were away back just on shooting the breeze. We were behind on everything. We'd been slaves, following blueprints, digging holes, and filling them up again. He stopped. When they said all the old folks were going to move in on us, <laughs> that was the finish. We're human. We've got a right to live like humans. When it came to building more houses and planting more land so more people, and old people at that, could move in to take over bossing us some more, <laughs> we'd had it. We hadn't gotten anything out of the job for ourselves. If the old folks moved in, we never would. They didn't mind working us to death. To hell with them. The reaction, said Calhoun, was normal. But if one assumption was mistaken, it could still be wrong. What could be wrong? demanded Fredericks angrily. The assumption that they lied, said Calhoun. Maybe Phaedra's son is getting ready to flare. Maybe your messengers were mistaken. Maybe you were told the truth. Frederick spat. Calhoun said, Will you clean that up, please? Frederick gaped at him. Mop, said Calhoun. He gestured. Fredericks sneered. Calhoun waited. Murgatroyd said agitatedly, Chee, chee, chee. Calhoun did not move. After a long time, Fredericks took the mop and pushed it negligently over the place he'd spat on. Thanks, said Calhoun. He turned back to the control board. He checked his course and referred to the half-century-old survey report on the Canis solar system. He scowled. Presently he said over his shoulder, How has the resting worked? Does everybody feel better? Enough better, said Fredericks ominously, so we're going to keep things the way they are. The old folks sent in a ship for a landing, and we took the landing grid and dumped rocks where it had run into them. We're going to set up little grids all over so we can fling bombs up. We make good bombs. If they try to land anywhere besides Canopolis... And if they do make a landing, they'll wish they hadn't. All they've dared so far is drop printed stuff calling us names and saying we've got to do what they say. Calhoun had the inner planet, Canis III, firmly in the center of his forward screen. He said negligently, How about the little kids? Most of you have quit work, you say. There's not much work, bragged Fredericks. We had to make stuff automatic as we built it, so we could all keep on making more things and not lose hands tending stuff we'd made. We got the designs from home. We do all right without working much, Calhoun reflected. 
If it were possible for any society to exist without private property, it would be this society, composed exclusively of the young. They did not want money as such, they want what it buys now. There would be no capitalists in a world populated only by the younger generation from Phaedra. It would be an interesting sort of society, but thought for the future would be markedly lacking. But, said Calhoun, what about the small children, the ones who need to be taken care of? You haven't got anything automatic to take care of them. Pretty near, Fredericks posted. Some of the girls like tending kids, homely girls mostly. But there's too many little ones. So we hooked up a sight circuit with multiple outlets for them. Some of the girls play with a couple of the kids, and that keeps the others satisfied. There was somebody studying pre-psych on Phaedra, and he was sent off with the rest to dig holes and build houses. He fixed up that trick so the girl he liked would be willing to take time off from tending kids. There's plenty of good technicians on Canis Three. We can make out. There were evidently some very good technicians, but Calhoun began to feel sick. A psych circuit, of course, was not in itself a harmful device. It was part of individual psychiatric equipment, not med service work, and its value was proved. In clinical use it permitted a psychiatrist to share the consciousness of his patient during interviews. He no longer had painfully to interpret his patient's thought processes by what he said. He could observe the thought processes themselves. He could trace the blocks, the mental sore spots, the ugly, not human urges which can become obsessions. Yes, a psych circuit was an admirable device in itself, but it was not a good thing to use for baby tending. There would be a great room in which hundreds of small children would sit raptly with psych circuit receptors on their heads. They would sit quietly, very quietly, giggling to themselves or murmuring. They would be having a very wonderful time. Nearby there would be a smaller room in which one or two other children played. There would be older girls to help these few children actually play. With what they considered adult attention every second, and with deep affection for their self-appointed nurses, why, the children who actually played would have the very perfection of childhood pleasure. And their experience would be shared by, would simultaneously be known and felt by, would be the conscious and complete experience of each of the hundreds of other children tuned in on it by psych circuit. Each would feel every thrill and sensation of those who truly thrilled and experienced. But the children kept so happy would not be kept exercised nor stimulated to act or think or react for themselves. The effect of psych circuit child care would be that of drugs for keeping children from needing attention. The merely receiving children would lose all initiative, all purpose, all energy. They would come to wait for somebody else to play for them. And the death rate among them would be high, and the health rate among those who lived would be low, and the injury to their personalities would be permanent if they played by proxy long enough. And there was another uglier thought. In a society such as must exist on Canis III, there would be adolescents and post-adolescents who could secure incredible, fascinating pleasures for themselves once they realized what could be done with a psych circuit. Calhoun said evenly, In thirty minutes or so you can call Canopolis on space phone. I'd like you to call ahead. Will there be anybody on duty at the grid? Frederick said negligently, There's usually somebody hanging out there. It makes a good club but they're always hoping the old folks will try something. If they do, there's the grid to take care of them. We're landing with or without help, said Calhoun, but if you don't call ahead and convince somebody that one of their own is returning from the wars, they might take care of us with the landing grid. Fredericks kept his jaunty air. What'll I say about you? This is a med ship, said Calhoun with precision. 
According to the Interstellar Treaty Organization Agreement, every planet's population can determine its government. Every planet is necessarily independent. I have nothing to do with who runs things or who they trade or communicate with. I have nothing to do with anything but public health. But they'll have heard about medships. You had, hadn't you? Y y yes agreed Fredericks, when I went to school, before I was shipped off to here. Right, said Calhoun, so you can figure out what to say. He turned back to the control board, watching the steadily swelling gibbous disk of the planet as the med ship drew near. Presently he reached out and cut the drive. He switched on the space phone. Go ahead, he said dryly. Talk us down or into trouble, just as you please. End of Part 3 And so, uh, you're going to have to tune in the next time, hopefully soon. Uh, these are kind of cruising, and I keep thinking this is number four. This is number five of the Big Appreciation Showcase, so you can extrapolate anything I said up to now. I, I, I just... The confusion is big here, and I, I even I can't believe how prolific I've been on this series. Um, but tune in the next time, and there will be the other three chapters awaiting for you and me, and uh, the, any Murray Linster fans. And I mean, if you're really that overeager, you can always traipse over to LibriVox or Archive.org and find old Phil Chenever and the conclusion on your own uh, volition, so to speak. Uh, we got one more thing before we finish up here on this number five appreciation, and uh, I am a huge fan of Orson Welles. Best known, I suppose, for Citizen Kane and his film work, um, which is epic and amazing. If you've never seen, say, The Magnificent Ambersons, which they did change the ending of, I don't think any of his big studio films were released unaltered, much to his dismay. And uh, he, he was very forceful and problematic for Hollywood, who especially in the day was uh, reticent to give control, especially after he made so much trouble with Citizen Kane and William Randolph first and all of that. That hurt RKO Pictures greatly. Uh, may have even... Um, added to their rapid demise because Citizen Kane, had he just done it a little different, probably would have been one of uh, the just even the Hearst papers would have said, wow, this is great, because especially for its day, it was. But he did, the, the, getting back to what I'm talking about, an epic amount of radio. Um, he had the Mercury Theater which, of course, is famous for the War of the Worlds broadcasts and other uh, theatrical and literary higher-brow productions. He appeared on many shows. He was a guest host for Jack Benny, for example, uh, when Jack Benny was ill in the 40s. He was a guest regularly on Rudy Valley's shows and, and many others, and uh, I hope to include more of that in my older podcast. I have often featured Orson Welles because I, I, he's one of my heroes of pop culture. Um, to Even when it went against him and to his detriment, he was a fighter all the way. And uh, there's a lost project of his with uh, partially read, right from the book, recited the Moby Dick book by uh, Herman Melville. I've seen a couple of clips of it. And no, he didn't finish the whole book, but he had it in his head to, which is just an amazing cinematic thing because reading all of Moby Dick is quite a long thing. And I can't imagine, even at home, I mean, yes, you could listen to the audio book, but to actually sit and watch Orson Welles read it, it boggles the mind. Um, when he was making his ill-fated It's All True and traveled to South America, he used his Mercury Theater banner to produce this program, which um, we're going to probably have a couple of exemplars of as we go on, but this is an episode on 
Mexico. Um, from what year is this? January 10th, 1943. This is episode eight of a series he called Hello, Americans. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents the Mercury Theater in a special series of broadcasts about the other Americas produced by Orson Welles. <laughs> Hello, Americans. I stand here in a room of a building in this modern city, surrounded by streets and planning and the shadows of monuments. There are parks here, playgrounds and plazas, churches, cathedrals, and holy air. There are marketplaces, laughter of people, electricity, motor cars, the singing of women, Age is here, and the wisdom of it. Time is here, in the stillness of the land. Time surrounds the city with huge hills, snow-covered, solemn. The conquistador lies below us now, beneath the foundation of the buildings, beneath the stones of the city he lies. All the weapons of slavery are dust in the earth. The chains, the lances the cannon, the hard skulls, all are packed down by the weight and anger of centuries. There were graves in Mexico for tyrants then. There is room for graves still. He who comes to conquer this soil will learn to sleep under it forever. A mile from where I stand, the voice of Moctezuma spoke. His palace is now one side of the Plaza Mayor. In the subsoil of the Plaza Mayor, the Aztec calendar stone was found. Piedra del Sol, the stone of the sun. On its stone face are carved figures. They tell the time, the month, and year. Frozen in the giant stillness of the past. They return us to the time, to the history, to the name. To the invisible dead. Kukulkan. Quetzalcoatl. The god. Tall with white skin. He went among the people. The land is sacred. It belongs to those who work it, who plant and reap, not to those slavery is ungodly. Each man is master of his own body. There is enough in this land for all. All should be dead. I, Emperor of the Aztecs, proclaim that Quetzalcoatl be punished. Find him! Bearded one has fled. East he goes in his ship. He will be back. Will come by sea. He has set the date. He will return, bringing us freedom. The date. Set. The date was set. 1519. Almost on the day, a sail appeared in the east. The people quivered with hope. Moctezuma trembled on his throne in the mountains. The sail sagged on the mast. And a man set foot on Mexican soil. Cortez. Hernan Cortez. Gold lured him here to this very city, then called Tenochtitlan. And it stood in a clear lake like a jewel. And its temples were brighter than a hundred suns. The lake is gone. And many temples are gone. But Moctezuma walks in the blood of Mexico with all his sadness and suffering. Moctezuma, standing at the temple, facing the terrible god of war. What do they bring, these white strangers who march westwards from the coast? Shall we sharpen our flints for them? 
Only the wind answered. Only the silent air with its wild omens of doom. I speak to you, O God of peace. What do these strangers bring? Do they tell you, Moctezuma? Do the gods warn of the Spaniards? The white men? Will you call out your warriors, O king? Let them enter the city. Perhaps they are children of the sun. Bring them fruit and wine. They shall know we are not cannibals. The causeway's open. And the Spaniard armor shines like the surface of the lake. The air is quiet on this day. Cortez, horseman, hero, advances to the center of the city, smiling. White visitor, be welcome. This palace belongs to you and your brethren. Rest after your fatigue. Then I shall ask what brings you visiting to our island city. I shall answer you now, great Montezuma. I have come to see so distinguished a person as yourself, to spread the wonders of your empire. We must prepare for a bold stroke. Montezuma's uneasy. He asks questions. Shall we battle their army then? No. We strike where we'll dazzle them most. We strike at Montezuma, the heart of the body. Do you dare, Conquistador? A few hundred men? A known quantity of blood? To pit against these minions? I tell you, Montezuma, this is no time to seek counsel from the stars. These men are not gods. They walk as men. They can die as men. Too late. Too late. The Spaniard strikes swiftly. The great Moctezuma, whom only the air dared touch, is learning the logic of chains. Speak, O king, for they have defiled you. They have struck at the hand of friendship. This very moment they run through the temples looting and burning. The civilized man has come bearing gifts, Montezuma. The eastern world has come to save you. They prod you to the window. They have a knife at your back, O Emperor. Your people are below, impatient, deadly. Speak, Montezuma. Tell them to lay down their arms, or you'll die. Be tall at the window. Be strong. Be greater than these conquerors. Below, the Aztecs sound like a burning forest. They think you betrayed them. They throw stones. Be strong, Moctezuma. For the arrows are on their way, dipped in their anger. Arrows for your heart. The blood is out. It falls. The empire bleeds. So, Cortez, is your triumph here? You're far from Cuba now, or the sea. You're in a city on a lake, and the causeways bristle with men. Mexico waits for you, conquistadores. Listen. On the open causeways they fought. The Spaniard hacking his way through the bridges pulled down. The Aztecs dragging the riders down to the water. And they fought on the bridges and under. Fought with the fury of tigers. The men from the east and these tough warriors. And the wind. Heavy with the odor of blood. There was no surrender. There was death and pestilence. But there was no surrender. There was ruin and desolation. And a forest of dead covered the valley of Mexico. In the history of conquest, as Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Hitler, and the rest are called great, so Cortez was great. No adventurer was ever more daring. He burnt the ships that brought his little army from Cuba so no man of his could turn back. A handful, stifling in rusty armor, they braved strange mountains, terrible jungle, and lived to assassinate a civilization. The Aztecs fell before the gun and the horse, and the slave empire of Moctezuma joined the dust of empires. 
So the Spaniard raped Indian Mexico and held it in chains for three centuries. Mexicans won back Mexico in the end. But the Spaniards came again. This time, a joke of history by invitation. Another shipload of Spaniards has come. Over 2,000 in one ship. Your grandfather is sleeping. I'm not sleeping. What is this about 2,000 in one ship? Don't try to hide it from me. I know. Mexico's been invaded again. No, Grandfather, you don't understand. Someone fetch me my rifle. Grandfather, I'll shoot through the window. These people are not our enemies. They've been fighting a civil war in Spain. I know that. You think I'm a fool? The loyalists have been defeated, Grandfather, and we're offering them a home here in Mexico. Spaniards are Spaniards. No, Grandfather, a Spaniard's a man. And there are two kinds of men in the world. Those who march forward and those who march backward. I'm 86 years old. That's the first time in 86 years I've ever heard a member of my family say anything that made sense. Somebody fetch me a glass of wine! Once again, the Spaniard invades the Mexican soil. But this time, he does not bring his swords and cannon. I come from Guernica, the holy city of Spain. Hitler and Franco destroyed our city, and now I am here. What work do you do? I teach Mexico how we make wine in Catalonia. I am from Barcelona. I play the violin in the Orquesta Sinfonica Nacional. I used to practice medicine in Madrid. I practice medicine in Mexico City now. I was a teacher in a Spanish university. Today, I teach here in Mexico. I'm an artist, senor. A ham artist. A ham artist? <laughs> That's one thing we never admit back in the States. Oh, see, si, ham artist. I teach Mexico a fine way to cure hams. Food, you know, hams. I've brought what I know. I've brought, too, my hatred for fascism. That hatred is shared by your adopted country, senor. By the people, by 18 million of them, by the workers and their unions, the men and women of professions, the musicians, the painters. All share your hatred of tyranny, your love of freedom. You know, and Mexicans know, that freedom is a prize hard won and easily lost. You know, and Mexicans know, that so long as somewhere freedom does not live, free men must die for it. For 300 years after Cortez, Mexico bowed her head. Then the bones of her ancestors stirred. The Indian blood, the peasant anger stirred again. From the south, the Grito de Dolores, the cry of 50,000 peasant voices, thundered their anger against the Mexican skies. Father Miguel Hidalgo, obscure parish priest, the father of Mexican independence. We are resolved to sustain man's inalienable rights. We will sustain these rights by letting rivers of blood, if necessary. Rivers of blood did flow but they left a brief red stain on a conscience of a people. And from his prison cell, the captive priest put by his beads and spoke to the sons of men. O oh, ye who inhabit the earth, be my witness. I call you to behold the crimes which have been here perpetrated, and in my deep grief, call the whole world to see for itself the pain which is here in my land. Even before the echoes of Hidalgo's lament had died away, a new leader had arisen, a young guerrilla warrior, Jose Maria Morelos. Hidalgo was executed, but over the crash of the rifles, Morelos hurled the people's defiance. America is declared independent of Spain or any other foreign power. The seed was strong. The soil was rich. Another man walked into Mexico... No conquistador, no fiery rider, no great king or his power behind him, but the people's power, Mexico's power, Benito Juarez. And in this city, in the Alameda, a monument stands for this man, and along the Avenida Juarez his ghost still walks. This time the conquistador was within and the people closed their terrible ring 
And Emperor Maximilian learned what Cortes did. The soil of Mexico has room for tyrants. Centuries of room. This man Juarez, this lawyer with craggy face and stovepipe hat, Lincoln of the lower continent, what fire burned in his silent eye? His hands are hands of a peasant. His face is known a whip, the back too is bent. In school, the Spanish gentlemen turned their backs as if my Indian face was a disease. I am not bitter. I am ashamed for Mexico. Lawyer Juarez. To Governor Juarez. With the wind of war rising among his people. Poverty's war. And Juarez walked through village and city. Searching. Keeping his faith with the people. Taking his strength from the people. For he was one of them. The poor. The proud. Why are the workers on the road chained? Why are the workers in the mines chained? You see, senor, there are reasons. Besides, they are happier that way. So, a Mexican is happier in chains. You think so? Soon you shall hear a noise, senor, greater than thunder. It will be the chains breaking. <laughs> Juarez waits for the hour to strike. Waits like a boatman for the tide. Listens to the stirrings of the people. Juarez could wait. His people had waited for centuries. There was strength in waiting. And the moment had come. Juarez in exile, penniless, leaves his rooming house in New Orleans. Alone, he returns to Mexico, the center of flame. He walks through the jungles alone in his black coat to meet his army. Walking with the strength of hills. Walking with the wheel of history. By foot, by ship. Alone he comes. Welcome home, Wallace. People rise. The people wake at last. They converge toward the angry cities. The fishermen with their shining knives. The sowers of corn and cane. Farmers with scythes, the straight and the bent. From Indian towns and Spaniard towns, they came giving their blood. And blood soaked the dry earth. And man marched towards the dream of equity. Then it was Presidente Juarez speaking to the ambassador of France. You threaten me with this Maximilian. If he has landed on our coast, as you say, with Napoleon's army, tell him this. The people of the Americas know well how to receive conquerors. Tell him there is room for one more grave in Mexico. Maximilian stands on the hill of bells in Cerro de los Campanos on this cool morning of June 17, 1867. Facing his appointed rifles. Not all his royal friends could save him. Not all the voices of the sovereign kingdoms who came to plead for him. Juarez listened to the voices as they spoke. Then Juarez spoke. Maximilian must die, senores. Not for revenge, no, not for that. He dies because he is a sign of tyranny. Mexico says to the world, Know that as Maximilian dies, so dies his dream and the danger of it. The people have spoken. After Juarez, the scene darkens in Mexico. And to Porfirio Diaz, tyrant. Emiliano, the food is on the table. Why do you sit there in the dark like a frightened wolf? Will you answer me when I ask you a question? 
I'm not hungry. Then you are sick. No. Don't turn your head away. Look at me toward the light. I... Who did that to you? Over Raleigh. With his horse whip? Yes. What have you to do with Rorales? I was at the farm of Tio Badillo when the Rorales came to take the land. What did you do? I threw a stone at a Rorale. That was a wicked thing to do. It was more wicked for the Rorales to take the land of Tio Badillo. The land of Tio Badillo is part of the Hedo. The police of Diaz do not recognize the common land. I think President Diaz is a thief. That is a dangerous thought. I have thought that thought since I was seven. Oh, an old thought, eh? Two years old. Yes. And what will you think when you are 19? I think I will kill many Rurales. And maybe even President Diaz himself. I think you will not live to be a man if you speak those thoughts aloud. Do you understand? But I can speak my thoughts to you. Yes. Yes, you can always speak your thoughts to me when we are alone and the door is closed. Now eat your supper. And let us hear no more of your thoughts until you are a man. A strong man. And to be strong, you must eat. I will eat and I will go strong. And someday the Rorales will run like chickens when they hear the name Emiliano Zapata. <laughs> my own office, without an appointment, without any warning, this flea-bitten, ragged, stinking crowd of peasants. Oh, bandits. Yeah. Bandits worse. A crowd of illiterate villagers who wanted to take action against the Asindados, claiming they were stealing their land. Such claims are common. Uh, the leader of these peasants... As I know, Emiliano Zapata. Yes, well, he had very little to say when I offered to call the police. Then they went quietly enough. They have no appetite for the rurales. They think because they were born on the land that it is theirs. The next thing you know, the parrots will be flying in from the jungles and claiming the mahogany trees are theirs because they were born in them. A parrot can talk too, you know. <laughs> Emiliano, I have come from the village. They have posted a paper about you in the Plaza de Armas. What does it say? You are banished from the state of Morelos. And you are not permitted to return. On pain of death. They've made me an outlaw. Very well. Others will join us. There are still men in Mexico who do not love a dictator. Zapata's white horse pounded like a war drum through the villages. His cry of land and freedom rallied a mighty army. Diaz died and the rich landowners replaced him with Madero. I aren't prepared to grant you full amnesty, Zapata. More than that. I'm prepared to give you an estate of 150,000 acres. Have you not heard that I'm fighting to restore the land to the people? Yes, I have heard. I'm fighting for everyone. Men of Mexico, it is better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. There are those in the state of Morelos today who will tell you that the body publicly exhibited on April 10th, 1919 was not Zapata, but a wax figure. Zapata is not dead, senor. He still rides. The thunder of his horse's hoof shakes the world. He is finishing what he started. Every man will have his own foot of land, and there will be no hungry child anywhere, and the buzzards will live on death will die of starvation. The people march, asking questions. The land is poor. There is no water for the soil. Can we grow food from stone? We have many oil wells, true, but where is work for us? Our children die of disease. Why must that be? There are no schools. Must our children not be able to write their names? They say we are a rich land. Rich for whom? Tell me that. Asking, searching, taking on the democratic stature. Somebody said Mexico is the land of mañana. Mañana means tomorrow. And tomorrow in Mexico is no longer an excuse. Tomorrow is more now than a promise. Here is a land 
with the longest yesterday in the new world. And no American nation has so advanced in the third decade of our century. No American people are more solemnly consecrated to the future. Viva la revolution! Revolution again? Yes. This time it's the National Revolutionary Party, the PNR, the CTM, the Confederation of Mexican Workers. We've arrived at the year 1934. They're cheering the new president, Cardinal, elected by the will of the majority. In 1910, there were 700 schools in Mexico, all in cities and towns. There were no schools for the children of peasants. By 1935, in the country, in the farm and cattle lands, there were 20,000 schools. The art of Mexico and Mexico's artists. Aztec and Mayan art, colonial, popular, tradition and progress. Orozco, Rivera, Sequeiro, more, many more. Great painting on public walls. Murals, art for everybody, and music for everybody. Roberto Chavez in the Orchestra Sinfonica Nacional. Popular music, folk music, mariachis, marimba bands, rancheros, boleros, the lovely ballads of the jungles, the plains, the mountains. Song and, while well, we're about it, wine and women. Say nothing of food. I'd like to do a whole series of broadcasts on Mexican cooking. Listen, you can hear the great bell of a cathedral. The largest bell on our continent. Well, there's so many things I wish I had the time to talk about today. The street in honor of Louis Pasteur, the Washington Monument here, the Don Quixote Fountain, the auto trailer camp, nightclubs, museums, cathedrals, the stadium, bullfights. Another time I'm going to tell you about Mexico's new president, uh, Camacho, and Padilla's magnificent achievement at the Pan American Conference in Rio. And now it's time to say goodbye. To leave you with a message from the Republic of Mexico. We declare the sincere friendship of the workers and the people of Latin America with the great people of the United States. We defend the same cause, the cause of the people. For this cause, we continue united, and we will be courageous in the future as we have been in the past. Our flag is the Atlantic Charter. Our slogan, the inviolate right of self-determination. Liberty for each nation of the world. Progress for the working people everywhere. Liberation of all mankind. You have been listening to the 8th in a series of programs about the other Americas in which the Columbia Broadcasting System is presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater. The Columbia Broadcasting System is the originator of South America's network of stations, La Cadena de las Americas. In the Southern Hemisphere, as well as in this hemisphere, CBS provides daily programs of news, entertainment, and recreation to bring about a closer understanding among Americans everywhere. Next week, the ninth program in this series will be brought to you by Orson Welles. Mr. Welles has recently returned from an eight-month visit to the Latin American countries for the office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. In the cast tonight, Laird Gregar was Montezuma, Hans Conrad was Cortez, Ray Collins was Juarez, Lou Marrow Zapata, and Agnes Moorhead Zapata's mother. Original music tonight was composed by Lucian Moravec and directed by Lud Buskin. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, that Orson Welles. A, a perfect way to kind of uh, close this particular installment. And um, I just, there's going to be more. It's in the ever-changing existence of the appreciator as uh, we travel through time together, backwards, forwards, and finding the best of the best and the interestingest of the interesting entertaining him with a little driveling for me. Um, that's where you find it. A, a tribute to Night Radio and a tribute to you, those who listen. We'll catch you the next time, and until then, set the controls for the heart of the fund. <laughs>